Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Carlos Ferraco. I'm a program officer at NINDS in the Division of Clinical Research. I wanna thank you all, of course, for deciding to attend the Imaging the Future of in vivo and Neuropathological Diagnosis Post-Mortem Analysis Workshop. Um, this workshop is the brainchild of Dr. Clinton Wright, who's the director of the Division of Clinical Research, and several of us at NINDS have been discussing and developing this workshop for some time. Um, so as you can imagine, we're very glad it has finally come to fruition, and we're certainly looking forward to an exciting workshop filled with insightful, insightful conversations and revelations, uh, which we aim to translate into action. And before I hand it over to Clint for his introductory remarks, <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge all of those who participated in and who have helped to organize the workshop, as well as uh, go over a few housekeeping rules. So uh, next slide, please. So as you can see here, we have over 20 discussants who have dedicated a significant portion of their time um, to make this workshop a reality, uh, particularly by joining us in pre-workshop pre meetings to share their perspectives on what advancements are needed in their fields, as well as the roadblocks they encounter. Uh, particularly from this list, I want to acknowledge uh, Konstantinos Arfanakis, Dirk Keen, and Bennett Landman, who volunteered to be the leads for their respective groups. Uh, next slide. I also want to acknowledge the NINDS, NIMH, and RLA, LRLA staff, which you see listed here, um, which participated in various ways to make this workshop a reality. So thank all of you. Um, next slide. And so again, as far as housekeeping, a few things to keep in mind. Um, so please, you know, actively monitor your webcam and microphone. Please try to remain muted and have your webcam off until it is your turn to participate or you are called on uh, during the discussion sessions. And of course, during the, the uh, keynote presentation, please do, please do not unmute to comment um, if you are not one of the main discussants or the speakers. Rather, you know, if you do have questions or comments, please drop them into the chat. We'll be monitoring those closely. Uh, during the Q&A period following the group discussion, so we'll have about five to 10 minutes for Q&A after each of the discussions. Uh, you can also then raise your hand uh, if you'd like to ask a question. If you do experience any technical issues, uh, please contact our virtual meeting tech support, uh, Derek Smith, who's our RLA tech. His email is listed here as well as phone number. So you know, please feel free to contact him whichever way is best for you. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Clint for uh, his intro. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I'm not gonna say a lot, but uh, welcome to everybody to this workshop. Uh, I think we have a really uh, great opportunity to, um, I guess my video wasn't on, sorry. Um, great opportunity to talk about this field. Um, and I wanted to, first of all, thank the, the speakers, the session leads, and all of the participants for, for joining. Uh, we have uh, quite a diverse uh, group of participants in terms of uh, fields of study. So we have about 60 uh, universities that are represented. We have about 30 people that listed themselves as being uh, in the imaging field and about uh, 22 uh, in the neuropath field, uh, many in, in neuroscience, uh, many in neurology, uh, different uh, forms of neurology, including cognitive neurology and, and stroke and TBI, uh, also brain banking, and then a number of other, uh, another, other uh, specialties like uh, engineering and pharmacology and even immunity. So uh, I think there'll be a, a, a tremendous opportunity uh, to, to talk uh, in a multidisciplinary uh, space uh, about the overarching goals uh, in this field and figure out how to stimulate research uh, in this area. Um, so from the NINDS uh, perspective, I guess we could think in terms of uh, whether we need brains. Um, and so one way to think about it would be how can people with conditions within the mission of our institute benefit from more research uh, in this area? Another question would be how to improve getting brains, and then finally, how to treat those brains once we have them when it comes to doing pathological work and imaging work, uh, whether uh, those brains are still in living human beings or whether they are in, in people post-mortem. Um, 
Another way to think about it would be in terms of opportunities uh, and barriers. Um, so as we go through the conference, uh, we can think in those terms as well and think about, we don't have to use formal <clears throat> SWOT analysis, but people could be thinking in terms of what are the cutting edge uh, areas that are worthy of a multidisciplinary approach? Um, where are their needs? Uh, do we need to develop data standards? Do we need to more harmonization across imaging and pathology? And what are the barriers? And some of those barriers may be uh, pipeline barriers. Uh, how do we get more referrals? Uh, how do we improve the bandwidth uh, to make sure we're getting high quality tissue uh, treated in, in, a, in, a, in a short interval as possible? Um, how to minimize uh, selection bias? And then others may be technical questions like the types of scanners that should be used, uh, how to treat tissue, uh, whether to fix, whether to use uh, specific uh, methods for, for, for handling uh, brains. Um, and then another way uh, to think about it is the in vivo to ex vivo problem. Uh, in the end, we really wanna be able to translate uh, what is going on in life with what is discovered post-mortem. So what are the brain properties that can be translated? And what is the need for validation? Uh, and what are the barriers to collaboration from in vivo to ex vivo work? So for example, we at NINDS and, and other institutes have funded many very large uh, prospective cohort studies, but the number of uh, pathological studies that are linked to them are relatively small compared to, uh, to those many cohort studies. So uh, can that be improved? Should that be improved? And what are the physical resources, the infrastructure, and even the technical resources such as software and, and atlases that may be needed uh, to, move, to move that forward? So those are just some thoughts uh, to sort of get the juices flowing, but there are many wonderful uh, keynote speakers and session leads and participants here that are much more uh, knowledgeable uh, about these, these issues. So I'm gonna hand it back to Carlos and we're gonna get started with a workshop, but thanks again uh, for coming. Thanks for summing all, all that up, Clint. I greatly appreciate it. So now um, we're gonna move on to our keynote address or joint keynote address, I should say, which will be given by Dr. Swati Rain and Susanna Vandalu. Um, so Dr. Rain is an assistant professor of radiology at the University of Washington Medical Center. Uh, she's also a member of the Integrated Brain Imaging Center there, as well as the director of the Diagnostic Imaging Sciences Center at, at UW. Um, the primary focus of her research lab is the development of clinically feasible targeted imaging and end-to-end -end analyses pipeline for functional and anatomical imaging to improve the diagnostic capabilities of MRI. And specifically, uh, Swati aims to develop novel perfusion imaging approaches to better understand cerebrovascular pathology for all major MRI platforms. Her research is currently funded by the Alzheimer's Association, the Dalton Family Fund, Phillips, the Royal Zoo Research Fund, and the NIH. Um, Dr. Vandalou is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at NGH uh, slash Harvard Medical School. Uh, she obtained her master's in clinical neuroscience at the Free University in Amsterdam and her PhD at the University Medical Center in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Her lab uses translational imaging approaches ranging from ex vivo MR guided histopathology and human brain tissue to in vivo two photon mi microscopy in mice to better understand the pathophysiology of sporadic and hereditary cerebral amyloid angiopathy. In particular, uh, Susanna's lab is interested in unraveling the mechanisms of hemorrhage formation and CAA and studying the driving force of perivascular beta amyloid clearance with a goal to find novel, novel targets for therapeutic intervention aimed at preventing hemorrhagic stroke and cognitive impairment in patients with small vessel disease. So now I'll hand it over to Swati and Susanna. Thank you, Carlos, for the introduction. I would also like to thank NINDS for giving me this opportunity to present our work. I also want to say that the panel and the um, members who have joined this workshop, they're all really senior researchers who I've worked with, and this work is built upon their experience, their work, and their mentorship. So I would also like to take the opportunity to thank them before I present the work. 
uh, that, uh, today. The title of my presentation is Can In Vivo MRI Predict Postmortem Pathology? And this is all towards the goal of improving the diagnostic capability of neuroimaging. I will be focusing mostly on white matter hyperintensities. Uh, Susanna will give a more detailed talk on other features of small vessel disease. So white matter hyperintensities are the gold standard for cerebrovascular disease or small vessel disease. Most individuals, almost 80% of the individuals have coexisting vascular disease pathology and degenerative disease pathology like Alzheimer's. Um, more importantly, they both share common risk factors despite their distinct etiology. So diabetes, hypertension, and poor lifestyle are, are all common risk factors here. Higher white matter hyperintensity burden does predict a worse cognitive outcome. And managing the white matter hyperintensity burden and slowing their development does help prevent a worse cognitive outcome over time, although the current management is really slow. One important thing about hyperintensities is that it is really a radiologic feature on a T2 flare MRI. I would, most of you here are already aware of those, but in the slide background, you will see a flare image and these white hyperintense patches. These are the hyperintensities, but you see them on an MRI. And if I replace this with a slice of tissue, I wouldn't be able to see these hyperintensities. Once you can identify them and you run immunohistochemistry or histology, you will see multiple pathological mechanisms at play in these hyperintensities. You see many vascular pathology, uh, wall, vessel wall hardening, blood brain barrier breakdown, inflammation, there's demyelination, uh, and also uh, neuron loss. So how do we really study these complex pathologies? Very commonly for neuroimaging, we see three imaging techniques used in vivo. Uh, that is flare to detect the hyperintensities, perfusion imaging to look at blood flow, and diffusion tensor imaging to look at white matter integrity. For this workshop, I just put this table on the side that shows all that's possible with in vivo imaging, what we can do with ex vivo imaging, and what else is possible with pathology. So yes, we can do flare both in vivo and ex vivo. With perfusion imaging, many studies have shown a decrease in cerebral blood flow in the white matter hyperintensities. Also, individuals who have a higher burden of white matter hyperintensities have poor cortical blood flow. And more interestingly, the area that is around the white matter hyperintensities, the penumbral regions, they have lower blood flow. And over time, they can convert into white matter hyperintensities. We normally cannot study perfusion with ex vivo uh, imaging, but we do have some path markers that we can study. And this is not a comprehensive list, but it just shows uh, what we can do. Um, and we see a similar thing with diffusion tensor imaging, where there's reduced FA or increased uh, ADC in the white matter hyperintensities, and also around in the penumbral region of these hyperintensities. We can study DTI in vivo, we can also study it ex vivo, and then there are markers for myelination, for neuronal pathology, neuron counting that we can use with immunohistochemistry. So how do we compare neuroimaging and postmortem findings? In my opinion, in vivo imaging provides a very broad systems level understanding of pathology. So reduced white matter integrity or decreased blood flow. But what really caused that change? It's very hard to tell. And you could mitigate it partially by adding different types of imaging and getting to the an an answer. You could also use disease models that cause a very specific alteration in the physiology and then validate the imaging. But you could also use the right histology and verify potential causes of these observed imaging measurements. Another thing is pathology may evolve and look very different at the time of death. So neuroimaging that we do in vivo and that we do ex vivo, there may be a big time lapse between the two. And what we see in vivo might not just match up. Postmortem imaging is challenging. We can do fresh frozen tissue, but we can also do fixed tissue. And fixation alters tissue properties. I'm an MRI person, so I can see that it definitely alters MRI imaging properties too. And so you cannot directly just use in vivo imaging 
uh, protocols as is ex vivo. Uh, there's a change in the geometry of the tissue, so it's hard to have a spatial one-to-one -one correspondence easily. And it may alter some pathology marker measurements. And again, we cannot really measure all phenomena in postmortem. When we do immunohistochemistry, these markers are not exactly in the same slice because we have to go to subsequent slices. Uh, we can do multiplexing, but what is really the best approach to get a one-to-one -one correspondence between the in vivo pre-mortem imaging and post-mortem findings? So that's really the key question uh, we are here to address. So our study, our goal is to um, identify specific white matter hyperintensity uh, pathology using in vivo imaging. And the goal is to eventually find targets to reduce the cognitive sequelae of these hyperintensities. And we have a multi-pronged approach. We just started less than a year. So please bear with me as I go through our very preliminary findings. But I have a target dartboard here. And our first step is to develop in vivo imaging methods that are specific. The second is to try and validate these methods against, in our case, we are using fluid biomarkers, like blood-based and CSF-based biomarkers. Then we're also looking at pathology using tissue samples from a different set of individuals. And the goal is to see the, the, the aberrant measurements that we find in vivo, do we find a corresponding pathological marker postmortem? And finally, the goal is to be able to predict the tissue that is at risk pre-mortem and make sure that that is exactly what we find pathologically during our post-mortem examinations. So our goal is, again, just be more specific. And the analogy of an iceberg has been used many times to describe cerebrovascular disease and white matter hyperintensities. There's really a lot going on beneath the surface. So our approach has been to uh, consider white matter hyperintensities of two types, and that they have two different dominant pathologies. They could have dominant vascular pathology, and these could be the hyperintensities that are deep, are located along arterial border zones, and some white matter hyperintensities could have a dominant degenerative disease pathology, and these are the ones around the ventricles. It's not to say that the pathologies are exclusive, it's which one is more dominant based on where they are located in the brain. And vascular pathology can take the form of poor blood flow, uh, blood brain barrier dysfunction, non-compliant vessels, wall thickening, venous collagenesis. Uh, you could see neuronal rarefaction and demyelination when it comes to degenerative diseases. So we have developed a suite of imaging protocols for uh, studying over 100 individuals with varying degrees of cognitive impairment and vascular disease. We'll be looking at blood flow using arterial spin labeling. We're looking at vascular reactivity using a gas challenge, uh, blood-brain barrier permeability using a modified uh, A-cell sequence. Um, and then for degenerative pathology, we're looking at advanced models using diffusion tensor imaging is naughty and just FA and ABC, but we're also using myelin water fraction imaging to get an independent measure of the degree of myelination. And for the in vivo group, we will be using CSF based markers like the selecting albumin ratio, uh, total tau, MVP, and correlating them with these imaging uh, methods. In a separate group of over 100 brains in multiple regions, we will be looking at these hyperintensities and looking for wall thickness, paravascular spaces, axon density, demyelination, and we'll also do neuron counting. So this is the process for uh, neuropathology for ex vivo imaging and immunohistochemistry. And this is a figure I received from Dr. Christine McDonnell. Uh, she and Dr. Keen run the neuropathology core at UW and are, uh, I'm greatly thankful to them for making this part happen for my uh, research. So once the brain is fixed, it is put in the agarose gel sample and then imaged in our scanner. After it, the imaging is complete, the brain is sliced and then the slices and the MR slices are matched one-to-one. -one. After that, white matter hyperintensities and other pathologies are manually assessed and regions are identified for every brain. Here we see a full brain, but most of the times what we have is a half brain. And then once we have identified a location for immunohistochemistry, 
we may we mark regions with white matter hyperintensity, a region that appears normal on MRI and on histochemistry, and that's close to this white matter. We collect regions in deep white matter. We also collect regions in the gray matter that may be affected because of pathways that are connected through the white matter hyperintensity and gray matter that may not be affected at all. And here are some of the immunohistochemistry markers that we are looking at in Dr. Keene's lab. So uh, luxalfast blue for myelination, smooth muscle actin for vessel pathology, Wielchowski stain for looking at neurons and clumping, uh, neuron counting, and then MAP2 for neurons and dendritic uh, synapses. So very preliminary findings in about 10 brains with each having multiple uh, sample locations. Um, we look at perivascular space area in the deep and the periventricular white matter hyperintensities. And what we find is that the space around the vessel is much larger in deep white matter hyperintensities compared to periventricular. And they're compared to normal appearing white matter within the same white matter area. So periventricular, the normal white matter is also somewhere in the periventricular uh, region so that the vessel profiles don't change too much. On the flip side, when we look at degenerative pathology like myelin percent area fraction, uh, we see that the demyelination is strongest in periventricular white matter hyperintensity uh, and not so much in deep. It is lower, but it's not as low as it is in the periventricular regions. So what is the challenge when it comes to using postmortem data. As a new investigator who has just started on this kind of research and was mostly an in vivo neuroimager, um, I find these are the things that I end up talking about the most, is the right individual brains. Uh, at UW, I'm very fortunate to have access to well-characterized brains from multiple studies. But I think it's, a, it's, a, it's not easy to identify these brains. Finding the right tissue, we want to have postmortem tissue that is unaffected by later life complications or even cause of death. And we want tissue that has the white matter hyperintensity pathology, but also tissue that may be affected downstream because of the hyperintensity. So it's how much tissue can we get and can we use for our questions. What would be the right technique? Should we be looking at fresh frozen samples or fixed samples? And how does that affect what kind of pathology um, measurements I can do. And finally, once I have histology, I, I would like to be, my group would like to be able to provide more quantitative results. And so what do we do? Do we look at signal ba intensity based scaling? Uh, should we do cell counting or percent area fraction? What is the best way to quantify uh, histopathology. I think that's that's something that uh, our group is looking into and is, um, is, is still trying to find answers to. And here I show examples of two. This is the MAP2 strain, and this is intensity-based scaling, and we're trying to figure out what cutoff would be a good cutoff uh, as we were scaling the images. And this is a Bielchowski stain where we're trying to look at uh, beading and clumping of neurons and trying to figure out the correct thresholds to capture um, everything correctly. So what is the, um, what kind of another challenge is to predict pathology from pre-mortem imaging. And that's where we really wanna be. When we image somebody while they're alive, we want to be as accurate as we can be. So right now the questions are, how accurately does pre-mortem imaging reflect post-mortem pathology? It depends a lot on the time between the last in vivo MRI and time of death. It also depends on the cause of death because we don't want the cause to affect what we see postmortem. There is limited availability of paired in vivo and ex vivo data. I mean, we heard this earlier too. Um, and little functional information can be inferred accurately from postmortem pathology. As Carlos said, I'm very big on looking at perfusion. So when I see low perfusion in an in vivo scan, what does it really mean in postmortem? Does it mean a sparse vascular tree? Does it mean that the vessels are hardened and cannot, cannot dilate enough? Or does it just mean that there is so much neuronal loss that the metabolic demands bend down? And that's what I saw as lower perfusion uh, in vivo. 
So how do I find a correspondence between what I see in vivo and what I see ex vivo or uh, in, I, in him, uh, histology? Here is a case, um, kind of a representative example of an 88 year old female who passed away in 2019. And thanks to Dr. McDonald, we had a uh, research grade MRI, high resolution uh, half brain flares um, on, on, this, on this brain. We could pull clinical data, uh, which is much lower resolution, but we had T1 flares uh, on, on this individual in 2011, 2014, and in 2019. So notice the gap between her pre-mortem and ex vivo MRI, it's like almost five years. We see this white matter hyperintensities become growing larger over time, and it's almost a decade that we have spent in these images. We were able to register all these images together using waypoint registration, including the half ex vivo brain. And here we see uh, in blue, the white matter hyperintensities in 2011, which were which accounted for about 56 cc's in her brain. Uh, red shows the white matter hyperintensities uh, volume in 2014, and yellow is the white matter hyperintensity burden in 2019. Now, in 2014, the clinic had added diffusion weighted imaging. There was still no T2, no perfusion. And so using that DTI, we, the diffusion weighted imaging, we measured ADC. And what we find is in the core white matter hyperintensity that we see in 2014, ADC is higher than what we find in normal white matter. This is shown in blue. And the white matter core is shown here in 20, uh, for 2014 is shown in red. And then we took this yellow mask, this where the white matter hyperintensity had grown and seen in postmortem tissue. We looked at that on the 2014 scan and looked at the ADC. And you do see that there is, there's a lot of variability, but there is a jump in the ADC. And so could we have detected the tissue that is at risk for this individual that would have become a white matter hyperintensity? But is this the dominant pathology? I, is, it, is, is it neurodegenerative? We have no perfusion information. We had no other uh, medical information of this individual. So it's hard to be uh, accurate, but I think this is a good start. And the next step would be to look at histological markers within this, uh, this brain and, and see if it's really demyelination and neuron loss, what percentile, how much of it is there in these hyperintense regions. So with that, I would like to uh, just end with a few things about what could this working group do to address some of the challenges I mentioned. Uh, one, I think recommend a set of MRI methods that could be used in vivo clinically and ex vivo. They don't have to be identical because the MRI of the tissue properties are changing, but what should be done? Should we always run a T1, a T2, an ADC and a a cell scan clinically? Um, and what should be the ex, uh, ex vivo? Should we run a flare, a DTI? And what else should we run SWI? How could we make a better one to one correspondence between the pre mortem and post mortem pathology? Could we leverage data science methods to augment our data? So, in the example I showed previously, the neuroimaging in vivo data was low resolution. Could we make it high resolution so that it could match better with what we had ex vivo or the other way around? Um, can we combine heterogeneous data? Through our discussions uh, prior to the workshop, one thing that was very clear is every research lab uh, has a different way of imaging, has a different way of uh, gathering postmortem tissue and performing immunohistochemistry. Is there still a way of combining all of this? Um, I just I have given a couple of examples for um, using maybe data science approaches. Can we detect enhanced um, enlarged perivascular spaces, which are harder to see on a three Tesla, but can we use deep learning methods to see them? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure Susanna will have a comment on that. Um, can we develop predictive algorithms that use the in vivo imaging medical charts and then predict what we see postmortem um, in the brains? So then, and finally, identify the right histopathological targets and ask mechanistic questions like the one I had about perfusion, like what caused the slowing of, or what caused the lower blood flow in this individual? And can histopathology help me get to that answer? 
I think putting together a resource page, a website, or having a forum and just outlining what the existing resources are for newer investigators or investigators are thinking about going into this field would be useful. I have always found uh, such um, the resources very useful, especially that those that were put forward for the white matter hyperintensity and VCID working groups. Um, outline maybe existing in vivo imaging protocols. They don't have to be harmonized yet, but just what are the different protocols and why do they exist the way they are uh, for both in vivo, ex vivo imaging and IHC. Uh, have lectures or workshops on techniques, caveats um, for the same um, say pathology or same physiology and compare them um, in, 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 the, in the lectures or make available derived data and no need to put imaging, no need to make the measurements and make it available to researchers to use and um, make some sense out of, uh, out of it. And if there could be a platform, it, could, it actually goes back to point four and can be combined with that is to have a platform to collaborate, answer questions, um, using and maybe and actually look at the same data from different sides you know it's, it's like the six blind men looking at an elephant everybody is looking at a different aspect of pathology so um it, it would be great if that such an opportunity could be provided and i feel the three things that we are discussing the ex vivo uh, postmodern histology the in vivo imaging and the data science components it's like an iterative process they all three work in tandem we don't and they help each other and as this is an Escher painting, and I'm a fan of uh, Gerdel Escher and Bach, um, I think that through the workshop, through the three di different panels, I hope that we get a, a unified and at the same time, a very comprehensive sense of the diseases we are trying to study. So we can finally start working on how to cure them. And with that, I would like to thank uh, my mentors, my collaborators, and my lab members uh, from University of Washington, uh, from Leiden University, my participants, and all the brain donors, and, and my funding sources. This is a huge amount of work that we have undertaken, and it takes a village to get it done. So thank you to everybody who has been part of our studies. Thank you so much, Swati, for uh, giving this beautiful overview and for really setting the stage for our discussion over the next uh, two days. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sh share my screen. Hopefully that will uh, work. Um, and thank you so much to the organizers, and especially Carlos, for inviting uh, both Swati and myself to give this joint uh, introductory uh, lecture um, uh, to start a discussion uh, for this workshop. And what I would like to do in, in my slides is to give just a couple of brief examples of how um, we have used ex vivo MRI in our lab to uh, bridge the gap between in vivo clinical imaging on the one hand and neuropathology uh, on the other hand, and really trying to, um, to show two examples that take uh, a different approach from two different angles, but to get at sort of the same uh, the same problem. So in our lab, we are interested in a cerebral small vessel disease, uh, which is uh, common in older individuals. And two of the main um, sporadic subtypes of small vessel disease are cerebral amyloid angiopathy and hypertensive arteriopathy. And uh, they both carry a high risk of hemorrhagic stroke in older individuals and track closely with also cognitive impairment and, um, and dementia. And what I'm showing here on this slide are some of the traditional or conventional uh, MRI markers or MRI manifestations, if you like, of small vessel disease in the brain. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side are, are microbleeds, uh, GRE scan in vivo, and the right-hand side you see white matter hyperintensities that Swati already perfectly introduced, and a lacunar infarct. But if you ask a neuropathologist what they uh, would point to as being small vessel disease uh, neuropathologically, they would show probably something like this. So in the upper left corner here is an example of a cerebral amyloid angiopathy on the A-beta stain section. You see the accumulation of amyloid beta in the walls of cortical vessels and that's in angial vessels. In the lower left corner, you see an example of arteriolar sclerosis or venous collagenosis, which is often seen in the context of hypertension. And then I have just two examples of a parenchymal lesions in the form of an enlarged perivascular space here in the white matter. And this is an example of a cortical microinfarct. So showing these two slides uh, next to each other, it becomes uh, hopefully immediately apparent that there's uh, a big gap between what we call small vessel disease on, uh, in, on, on imaging on the one hand, and what we call small vessel disease from a neuropathological standpoint. 
And um, there, there are many gaps to point to specifically, but I just wanted to highlight two aspects that we've uh, encountered in our research when it comes to this gap between in vivo MRI and, and full vessel disease. And that is on the one hand that clinical MRI does not fully capture the whole burden of small vessel disease. So there are smaller uh, lesions in the brain that conventional MRI or in vivo clinical MRI simply just cannot capture because of lim limitations in resolution. And um, on the second hand, uh, we also still have an incomplete understanding of the pathologies underlying some of those small vessel disease markers on MRI, which Vadi already uh, pointed to in her presentation as well. We don't fully understand what are the specific changes to the small vessels uh, in the brain um, that give rise to these lesions on in vivo. So to bridge uh, some of these gaps, uh, what we and others have, have used in our in is a uh, post-mortem MRI, and that is uh, ex vivo scanning of uh, 4 million fixed um, brain tissue samples. And there are obviously many ways of doing this. And this is just an example to highlight how we've been uh, approaching this problem, what we've been doing in our lab for several years now. And um, we are mainly interested in, in studying cerebral uh, amyloid angiopathy. So th the first thing that we do when a patient is referred to our brain donation program is to verify their in vivo uh, clinical scans and their medical records confirm the clinical diagnosis of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So here's just an example of an in vivo scan where we can see these hallmark manifestations of CA, of cortical distribution of microbleeds in the scan. Then we receive formalin fixed uh, hemispheres that we subject to ex vivo MRI. In our case, we use a three Tesla MRI scanner and a somewhat standard uh, ex vivo protocol and where we scan brains overnight so to obtain um, relatively high resolution ex vivo scans. So this is just an example of a turbo spin echo sequence at around 500 microns isotropic resolution. And then we take the brains to our lab and, and cut them in coronal slabs. This and sample areas from predefined uh, cortical regions uh, to subject to routine neuropathological examination. Here's just an example of an H and E stain section from the parietal lobe in a patient. And uh, on the adjacent section here, when we're zooming in on this cortical region, we see characteristic amyloid beta accumulation in the cortical uh, vessels of this patient, verifying the, the, the neuropathological diagnosis. In some specific cases, we uh, take it one step further and sample smaller regions of the brain that we then subject to our uh, seven Tesla MRI scanner. So this is a, a, a longer protocol, which I think up to 24 or 48 hours, but really allows us to achieve uh, uh, ultra high resolution. So in this case, it's a 75 micron isotropic resolution scan in an area where you can see multiple cortical microbleeds. And then what we do with those samples, we take them and completely serial section through them in the lab to really uh, allow us to retrieve every single lesion that we can then study in a lot uh, detail under the microscope. And we need to compare our in vivo findings with, uh, with our neuropathology. So as I said, I just want to give two quick examples of how we've been using some of those techniques in our lab to and uh, the neuropathological correlates of some of those lesions and taking sort of the opposite approach uh, towards this problem. So the first example is that of cerebral microbleeds, which were first and foremost really described on MRI. This was an MRI observation in patients with small vessel disease, these round and ovoid lesions on the gradient echo sequences that were really pretty commonly observed and, and, and carried some clinical uh, uh, consequences in, in patients. But neuropathologists were often saying that they hardly saw these lesions under the microscope or with routine neuropathological examination at autopsy. So we and others have done a, a series of studies to, to really find those lesions in the brain ex vivo and then study their neuropathological correlates to see if those are indeed, uh, as what would be expected, uh, microbleeds. So this is just an example of an ex vivo MRI scan in a uh, formula fixed brain slab in a patient that had microbleeds. So here we were able to identify uh, lesions in the cortex that look like microbleeds as seen in vivo. And then we were able to retrieve those lesions on a corresponding H and E stain section, where we now outline these lesions here, one, two, and three. And the same location is what we see on MRI. Uh, don't get fooled by the, the black dots here. This is just ink to help retrieve those lesions. Um, then we, when we zoom in on one of those parenchymal lesions, this is example number three, uh, which is located here in the cortex and here on the MRI. Um, we see these, these brown hemosiderin deposits, which are really indicative neuropathologically of vessel rupture and bleeding, so extravasation of blood products into the tissue. And what's, what's apparent when you look at the skill bar, these are really small. This is uh, 100 microns in diameter, which when you compare that lesion to what they look like on MRI, we can see that they are almost a few millimeters on MRI. So really, um, they're being overestimated, if you like, on, on MRI. And that is because they have a 
high omdens. So the blood breakdown products are iron positive. And as you know, MRI is really sensitive to iron. So we tend to see them uh, somewhat augmented on MRI, um, which helps their detection in vivo due to the so-called blooming effect, which could uh, also explain why we were so, um, why we can easily detect them in vivo, but not, not often encounter them on routine neuropathological examination. But taking it one step further, we're using uh, targeted uh, imaging and targeted sampling of individual microbeads and then using serial sectioning, we could really try to, to study the individual vessels at the site of rupture. Imagine uh, sectioning through an individual microbead to identify exactly the vessel that supplied that lesion and also the, the site of rupture of that individual blood vessel. We were able to then study those vessels to try to understand more about the underlying mechanisms that drive hemorrhagic uh, lesion formation in these brains. So here's an example of a cortical microbead, again, in a patient with CAA. And we see the corresponding uh, microbead here on the, on the H&E stain section, really characterized by this blob of extravasated red blood cells that come out of this vessel that is abnormal and that contains blood breakdown products in the vessel wall. And then using recent section stained for animal beta, one of the observations that we were able to make using this approach is that we found a paradoxical absence of animal beta deposition in the walls of the vessels at the rupture site, whereas normal circumferential CA was observed upstream and downstream of those sites. And another observation we made that these vessels were abnormally enlarged and also showed evidence of vascular remodeling. So this really led us to, to understand more uh, about the underlying pathophysiology that drives these lesions by comparing the ex vivo MRI to, to the neuropathology. The second example that I'd like to, uh, to, to give is, is that of cerebral microinfarcts, which uh, is kind of getting at it from, an, from the opposite approach, because in contrast to uh, cerebral microbleeds, microinfarcts were first and foremost described on neuropathology. These are frequently observed in large neuropathological studies. Uh, Julie Schneider and colleagues, who was also on this call, uh, really reported on these microinfarcts um, that very commonly observed in neuropathological studies. And they seem to outnumber hemorrhagic lesions in the brain, and they track very closely with cognitive impairment uh, pre-mortem. But uh, uh, about 10 years ago, still, these lesions were considered widely on in vivo MRI. We're not able to detect them and study them uh, during life because um, they do not benefit as microbleeds from this blooming effect. There's no extravasation of blood products. There's no iron positive cells. So we, we don't benefit from that blooming effect or enhanced detection of these lesions in vivo. So we had to find a different contrast mechanism to study these lesions uh, on in vivo MRI. So again, we, we and others have uh, used ex vivo MRI uh, for this problem to try to identify um, the, the specific contrast mechanisms of microinfarcts, these ischemic lesions uh, on MRI, and try to translate those findings in vivo. So here, and I apologize for not adding the skill bar here, but the size of the, the microinfarct on MRI very closely corresponds to the size on the H&E stain section under the microscope. So using these approaches, we were then able to define detection uh, criteria that we've been able to translate to in vivo and um, so both uh, high resolution seven Tesla MRI as shown here in this example, um, and also three Tesla MRI, which is more uh, uh, conventionally and traditionally available. So using this approach, we're able to devise these detection criteria, which has led to several studies able to study the factors during life and also the functional consequences of microinfarcts over time. And just to note, these are obviously the, the larger microinfarcts of the spectrum. We still are not able to detect the smallest uh, microinfarcts uh, on MRI, which is still pending improvement in, in image acquisition and increased resolution. So just to, to uh, end my presentation with uh, just one set of slide, uh, one slide on, on the challenges, because Swati already uh, beautifully listed a whole number of challenges and, and topics we can address during this workshop, just to add a few that I've come across in my MRI research and talk into first and foremost the small sample size that we're still facing. So we're relying on clinically diagnosed patients with a specific uh, subtype of small vessel disease. So we're limited to a small sample size and we, it's, it's hard for us to upscale our uh, imaging findings to larger samples. Um, challenges in terms of access to control brains. Um, we rely on, uh, for our controls mainly so far, uh, patients who've been diagnosed with CA during life, but then turn out not to have any amyloid deposition uh, post-mortem. And as you can imagine, for a lot of our research questions, we'd really wanted to rely on pure non-neurological controls. Still remains a challenge. Um, 
in terms of co-registrations in in vivo MRI and ex vivo MRI in neuropathology, we really want to make sure that we're looking at exactly the same lesion that was visible in vivo, in both ex vivo and at neuropath. So there are main challenges in, in really try to, to get all of those images in the same space to, to make sure that we're looking at the same lesion. And then um, we are thinking a lot about uh, these days and how to quantitatively assess neuropathological markers. So traditionally, neuropath assessments have relied on semi-quantitative measures of um, scoring small vessel disease as mild, moderate, or severe. But there's a real push now to, um, to develop advanced quantitative methods using machine learning and AI um, to, uh, to get more reliable and also continuous outcome measures that we can then co correlate and compare to our MRI markers. And there are some challenges involved there in, in terms of choosing the right training set and adding data from outside sources that can also be um, compatible with our AI uh, algorithms. And then finally, a uh, challenge in terms of data sharing. A lot of our ex vivo MRI scans are large. The file size is very large. The digital slides are very large. And how to um, facilitate sharing with collaborators in the field still remains a big challenge. And obviously there's many, many more uh, challenges that we can add to the list here, uh, but just to set the stage a little bit and hopefully we can dive into these challenges together during this workshop and, and find common um, solutions for these together. So uh, just as Swati just said, uh, it really takes a village to get all of this up from off the ground. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank our brain donors and their families for really making the most precious gift to our research program of, of donating uh, one's brain. Um, this has a long history of brain donation program in our center, so a huge thank to uh, Steve Greenberg, who is the director of our hemorrhagic stroke research program here, who's enabled access to patients and, and really um, facilitating this, this program. A clinical research coordinator and senior data manager facilitating the autopsy process and all the logistics involved with brain donation. A neuropath team, uh, including Matthew Farsh and our neuropath fellows, who have been instrumental in, in facilitating autopsies at our center and uh, providing uh, information for outside neuropathologists and, and uh, resources for autopsies and extractions in their sites. And a wonderful colleague of Andre and Bruce, who've been instrumental in developing our ex vivo MRI scans and continuously uh, and continue to optimize these sequences for improved uh, detection and acquisition. And those in, in my own lab who uh, really um, do all of the physical work in, in terms of, of scanning, sectioning, staining, digitizing the samples, which, uh, which is obviously a lot of work. And uh, thank you so much again for the invitation and for um, the workshop putting all of this together. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion over the next few days. Thank you both, Swati and Susanna, for those excellent presentations. Um, you know, clearly you've detailed not only the excellent work that you do, but most importantly, right for this workshop, the challenges that you encounter in melding in vivo and postmortem data, the gaps that you perceive to exist between the fields, and you know how, how you're really attempting to uh, address those challenges. Um, you know, so Swati also at the end of that of her presentation brought up a few suggestions, right, which I'm sure you both worked on, um, and just. Just wanted to keep those front in everybody's mind. So, you know, Swati brought up a few things like developing common set of MRI methods um, for clinical in vivo, and then as well, ex vivo imaging to facilitate correspondence. Um, also, you know, thinking about what data science methods could potentially be used to or, or leverage to augment data, as well as maybe even, you know, having a, a resource or a database of those existing resources. Um, which brings me to our, our next presenter, uh, Dr. Abigail Soyumbo from NIMH. Um, Dr. Soyumbo is a director of the NIH Neurobank, and I, and I sorry, NIH Neurobiobank, and she'll be giving a brief presentation about this excellent resource. Um, so Abigail is not only presenting about this resource because of course it is something that we want you all to be aware of, but because it is a resource that we would like to be considering in the discussions uh, to better understand how we can possibly uh, make that more accessible to all of you. And to also understand if you're using it, how you're using it, and what you would potentially like to see changed. So with that, we'll hand it over to Abigail. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Carlos and Clint, for the invitation to present on the NeuroBioBank resource. Uh, my name is Abigail Soyumbo. I'm a program officer in NIMH. And uh, I co-manage uh, the Neurobiobank with Daniel Miller and Olivia Spicer. So um, at the end of this presentation, I would uh, hope that you're familiar with how donors come in. Uh, if uh, 
in case you would like to refer some of your research subjects uh, to the program. Uh, you would understand the referral process, understand how uh, donors and tissues are characterized, uh, and also be familiar with the uh, request process for when uh, you need to uh, obtain tissue from the neurobiobank. So uh, the neurobiobank uh, network provides a consolidated approach to human brain banking. And it was set up back in 2013 as the uh, IC directors wanted to uh, consolidate uh, the different banks that were funded through grants and uh, to enable uh, the resource to serve a broader research community. Under the neurobiobank model, all researchers have access uh, to tissue, uh, basically by going to a centralized IT portal to request a tissue from any of the banks. Um, uh, the repositories, have, uh, they contracted with the NIH and have agreed to collect, process, uh, characterize and distribute in harmonized ways. And since the inception of the program, uh, the program officers, NIH program staff have continued to work uh, collaboratively with the banks to further harmonize our processes. So uh, searching uh, for tissue is um, straightforward and uh, NIH program staff oversee the process to ensure that all qualified uh, researchers have access to tissue. Um, okay, so basically, um, as uh, I'm sure many uh, are familiar, uh, the uh, neurobiobank uh, consists of six uh, brain banks uh, contracted with the NIH, and they're listed here. Uh, at the uh, different parts of the country, uh, which is also useful in terms of uh, getting donors, uh, diverse donors um, into the uh, resource. And um, we work with the Brain Donor Project, which is a nonprofit that serves uh, as an outreach arm uh, of the Neurobiobank, in addition to uh, the outreach efforts of the individual banks. Uh, also, um, there are several partnerships that the um, Neurobiobank engages in. Um, the informatics uh, program is uh, also contracted uh, by the NIH, uh, where the repositories uh, deposit on a quarterly basis all the um, all the collection uh, information data available to the uh, IT portal. We also have a centralized toxicology texting service, so all sites can um, or do submit uh, or tissue to be tested and report back. The information is reported back to the NIH. Uh, additionally, working with a number of partners, uh, Autism Brain Net, or uh, the Brain Donor Project, uh, a number of Alzheimer's disease research centers uh, work with us in a collaboration um, and some of this uh, I will describe later. Uh, the program is funded uh, by a number of NIH ICs, uh, NIMH, NINDS, and um, the Child Health, uh, Aging, NIDA, and the Blueprint for, uh, Blueprint for Neuroscience. Uh, Neurobiobank's mission is to facilitate research and to increase the awareness of brain donation. So the core uh, activities that all sites engage in are, are listed here, uh, outreach and registration of donors. Uh, important that we have a diverse collection and that's emphasized in the program. And also happens uh, organically uh, by the localization or uh, regional distribution of the sites. Um, also, the Brain Donor Project is a very important component of the network, uh, serves to, uh, uh, in the outreach program, uh, process and refers uh, to the banks uh, based on geographic uh, location. Uh, 
uh, as well as the existing collaborations that neurobiobank sites engage in with advocacy groups of studies or longitudinal studies and uh, other uh, outreach of processes. So also um, there's agreement on how uh, the recovery processing continuous improvement process of how tissues will be uh, processed, stored, the amount of data that will be collected uh, as much as possible. Of course, this will be post-mortem uh, assessments. And um, we also have a number of uh, nervous system tissue as well as non-nervous system, depending on the consent obtained uh, uh, from the next of kin or the authorization from the next of kin. So detailed post-mortem uh, characterization, both clinical and neuropathological uh, evaluation is performed or next of kin interviews, um, review of medical records as much as possible, as much as is available, um, histology, toxicology testing, as I mentioned, and a number of the sites would uh, perform a consensus uh, review to come up with a, a brain diagnosis based on all available data. We use the ICD-10 ICD system or to code uh, for clinical brain diagnosis. Um, importantly, uh, broad sharing of uh, tissue is a requirement. So the inventory is on a, a website, is publicly available to promote transparency and re the request and fulfillment process is overseen uh, by NIH program staff. Uh, diverse inventories uh, available on the sites. A number of the sites um, brought in existing collection uh, when they joined the Neurobiobank program also. So a uh, diverse collection or uh, neurodegenerative as well as neurodevelopmental, psychiatric and unaffected uh, control uh, tissues. So the request process is uh, via the uh, Neurobiobank uh, website. So as requests come in, the first contact would be with an NIH uh, program staff that would check that um, there's funding available, institution is recognized, it's registered, and uh, we also have an MTA uh, system in place. Uh, request is then uh, sent to uh, the Neurobiobank site reviewed by the coordinator, tissue coordinator and the director to uh, confirm availability. Um, for large requests, uh, we um, review, um, evaluate for statistical significance or relevance or scientific relevance. And uh, sometimes this might go to uh, a program staff to, uh, for expertise. A final approval will be given by the NIH staff, then tissue is prepared and distributed. So an average for non-complex uh, requests, uh, this will be filled within eight to 20 weeks. Large requests, uh, unfortunately, takes longer. And that's an area of challenge for us that we're really working with the banks, um, working even with, within NIH to make that process faster. So just to give you some of uh, the scale of uh, uh, requests that we receive every year, uh, on average, at least in the last few years, about 300 requests are processed uh, every year. Uh, so far since um, inception, uh, since the website started working in 2014, uh, we've received more than 2,300 requests, 1,700 have been fulfilled. A number of them are still in progress. And um, this um, here shows the age distribution um, of the um, uh, cases that we have. Uh, so quite diverse also in age, uh, as well as the race uh, uh, distribution. Of course, we're always working to improve uh, on our representation uh, of the subjects in the collection. 
So um, some of the challenges uh, that we have are re request fulfillment, more standardization, more harmonization. And uh, recently, uh, some of the new projects that we, uh, we've engaged in are uh, last year, uh, more th about 10,000 um, sp uh, individual specimens from uh, all six sites were submitted uh, for whole genome sequence analysis. Um, DNA was extracted at uh, one of our sites, uh, the University of Miami Genome Center. We wanted that process to be done at a single site. Then they were shipped also to a single site for short read sequencing. So we're hoping that data from uh, for this will be available um, in the NIMH data archive by the end of this year. Another project that started uh, in the last year is a collaboration with the uh, human, uh, the brain initiative to establish the uh, human brain cell collection within the neurobiobank. Uh, this collection is strictly standardized, and this has helped us also with our uh, continuous improvement uh, workflows. The collection is strictly standardized uh, to support single cell applications uh, for the uh, cell brain cell atlas projects. Uh, we're also in the last uh, few months embarking on 3D imaging, um, uh, digital imaging to support reconstruction. So this is ongoing. Um, we're perfecting the system. Uh, hopefully, at the end of the uh, uh, Bikan Brain Initiative Cell Atlas project, this collection would also be available uh, to the general research community. So I just wanted to uh, appreciate, um, acknowledge the NIH, uh, trans NIH project team that work uh, together on the, uh, on the Neurobiobank uh, project, including previous program leads. Uh, I I, I'm not sure if I have to take questions, but I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Abigail. That was a great presentation, definitely showed you know, obviously how the neurobiobank works, you know, the projects that you're involved in, and also importantly, right, the challenges that even we encounter are and even things like having, you know, a diverse sample, um, you know, which is very much related to social determinants of health and other, you know, diversity and equity issues. Um, we definitely do have time for, for a few questions. So if you don't mind answering that, you know, some, some questions, that'd be great. I think Dan is also on the call. So if he wants to jump in, um, that'd be great. But yeah, if, if you have a question for Abigail or Dan, please raise your hand or even insert it in the chat. There's a question in the chat, Carlos, from yeah, Swati. So, yeah, I just saw it. So we have a question from Swati saying, what information about the individuals is available that is associated with the tissue besides the diagnosis? So we have... Um toxicology analysis, um, neuropathology uh, analysis, serology, as well as, uh, not all the information that we have is available on the website. So, so I, I should have said that. Um, we're continuing to bring more information from the repositories to the website. Um, we have a serology, as well as next of kin information. Uh, we're hoping that we will be able to have uh, information about this SES and all of that uh, in the next few years also. So serology, toxicology, neuro, uh, neuropathological analysis, um, next of kin, uh, and as well as clinical medical records, uh, whatever information, uh, uh, the uh, banks are able to get. Thank you. So we have a few more questions. Um, next question was, how do you go about determining whether a donor is neurotypical or not? So for example, this person I mentioned she was diagnosed with autism in her 50s, and, but otherwise previously would have been, you know, she would have been thought to be neurotypical prior to that. Okay, so I can let 
uh, Dan answer some of this, but I'll take the autism uh, situation. So um, we use the ADIR interviews uh, by performed by trained uh, certified uh, psych uh, psychologists uh, to run that. But yes, I do understand that if people come up or later in life, if, uh, if for example, they died earlier before the disease or uh, symptoms, we'll rely on genetics if there's a known gene. Otherwise, yeah, that will be considered uh, neurotypical if there are no associated information. Oh, Dan, maybe you wanna take add to that information. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add. There we go, thank you. All right, well, thank you both. Um, I think we just have a couple more questions. So uh, this next question is, is there a publication that describes the neurobiobank recovery processing and storage protocols? And also do the NOK interviews include the recently developed uh, common data elements for postmortem clinical character characterization of individuals with TBI? So, uh at the beginning of the program, there was a publication. I think now we're going to, once after we get the whole genome sequence, we would set up another public publication that would be detailed on the process as well as the sequence uh, observations. Uh, I missed the second part of that question. Uh, the second part was, do the NOK interviews include the uh, recently developed uh, CDEs for postmortem clinical characterization of individuals with TBI? Um, I think if TBI would come up, the banks would know to use a, a structured um, uh, interview for that process. Otherwise, it would just be recorded as TBI without going into detail. And that's an area that we, uh, we should also. Uh, focus on in uh, to kind of characterize diseases in more detail. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Harry. I know some of the bank directors are online, so please uh, respond uh, as appropriate. So I do not misrepresent uh, what you do. And I guess well, I'm just going to comment on the autism question. That's a um, that's an issue that applies to all studies in vivo or otherwise, uh, at any given time, somebody can be characterized as neurotypical and then discovered two years, 10 years, 20 years later to have a, uh, a particular uh, disease, whether neurodegenerative, neuropsychiatric, or otherwise. Uh, that's something that we all confront with all our human studies. Yeah, and, and just to add on to that, uh, this is Insini Umo. Uh, so we can also work with, with Abigail and the team to also discuss incorporating neural path CDEs that I believe Kristen is, is referring to. Thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll just, uh... We have time for two more questions and there are two more here. So uh, one question from Russ Huber from Boston University. Uh, some techniques require large amounts of tissue like clarity. Are these types of requests considered? Yes, we do get, after review, yes, we do provide large amounts of tissue, yes. Uh, yeah. After review, it passes the review process back and forth with the requester to clarify, yeah, we'll provide the tissue. And, and I guess the only caveat to that, as you mentioned previously, is that that might just take a longer time to process that request. Yeah, time, yeah. Okay, and last question from Brittany Duggar from UC Davis. Um, with the diversity of diseases, that are covered, what neuropathological variables are collected across the whole series? So in other words, can you share your forms um, that 
detail, you know, what, what diseases or variables are reflected? Uh, I think for that, maybe I'll let uh, one of the directors answer that question. Okay, yeah, or well, maybe Dan. You. Yeah, I don't think we have a, we don't have a unified, as yet, we don't have a unified um, neuropathological assessment. Um, I think what the sites do is relatively standard and maybe, maybe um, Harry can comment on that or some, one of the other directors. There's also quite a bit of information on the website itself about what kind of information we collect and how much of it is present on the website and, you know, how much of it you can get uh, from the sites themselves uh, when you request your tissue. Yeah, uh, Dan, uh, the, the only, this is Harry Aratunian of uh, Mount Sinai. Um, the only comment that I would make is that the neuropathological assessment by all of the banks is relatively standard, standardized, but not identical. Um, most follow the um, CRAD protocol as the default protocol. Um, but obviously add um, significant additional sampling de depending on what the initial neuropathology shows. So it is relatively standardized, but not uh, identical across the board. And there is a distinction that's made <coughs> between young donors with no clinical indication of uh, neuro, neurological disease where uh, the initial neuropathology is uh, more of a screening than it is an in-depth neuropathological workup and young being defined as individuals under the age of 60. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, thank you. So we do need to move on, but I think we should um, take this one last question. I think it's important um, with respect to diversity. Um, so there's a question from Diana Trujillo Rodriguez. So what is your general outreach strategy to recruit black participants for brain donation? And I guess you can just maybe generalize that maybe even to minoritized uh, populations. Yes, yeah, so that, that is a real challenge. Uh, it turns out that the NeuroBioBank is actually not too bad in representation from African-American donors, but we have a lot of trouble um, having proper representation from Latinos and, and Asian folks. Um, so we're working hard on that. There's a few um, there's a few initiatives that are in the pipeline that I unfortunately can't really talk about, but they essentially are targeting um, those communities to understand, you know, what are the barriers to donation, uh, what are the misunderstandings, and to also communicate to them the importance to their communities of having having brain re brain tissue representation for science. Um, I think that's kind of, that's probably a pretty hand wavy and evasive answer. It's just to say, <laughs> we're trying hard. And, and we also have a neuropathology working group at NINDS that, you know, I'm on with Dan and a few other people um, where, where we try to discuss and address these issues or improve representation for the neurobiobank. Um, all right, well, thank you, uh, Abigail, for that presentation. That was great. And thank you all for those, those of you who, who posed questions. So we're gonna move on now to our first uh, discussion, which is the Benchwork slash Neuropathology Group. And I will hand it over to Rebecca Hummer from NINDS and Dirk Keen from UW, who will be leading and or moderating that session. Great, thank you so much, Carlos. Um, so uh, I think that we're going to get started with a very brief round of introductions, and I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I'm Rebecca Hummer. I'm an adult child and adolescent psychiatrist by training and a program director within the Division of Clinical Research. Um, we have six discussants who are part of the um, neuropathology group, and I'll ask them just to each very briefly introduce themselves with their name, their role, and institution. And um, why don't we start with you, Dirk, and we'll, we'll circle through the introductions before um, going back to you to get our discussion started. Thank you. 
Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Dirk Keen. Uh, I know a lot of you. I'm a neuropathologist at the University of Washington. I um, run our um, what we call the Biorepository and Integrated Neuropathology Lab, which is our, our neuropath core, which supports multiple different studies focused on dementia, um, uh, various forms of dementia, traumatic brain injury, uh, uh, cancer, and uh, neurotypical brain. So we work with the Brain Initiative. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, how about I see Stephen has his camera on? Yes, good morning. Um, I'm Stephen Back. I'm a pediatric neurologist and uh, uh, professor of pediatrics and neurology at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Great. And um, Anne? Hi, I'm Anne McKee. I'm at Boston University and the VA is in Boston. I'm a neuropathologist. Uh, I'm a director of this BUCTE center, and I'm director of multiple brain banks, Alzheimer's Center, Framingham Heart Center, the VA ALS, uh, and the CTE brain bank. John? Yeah, hi, I'm John Crary. I'm a neuropathologist at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. I work with Harry Harutunian here. I'm also uh, the director of a new program, the Neuropathology Brain Bank and Research Corps. I'm also the director of uh, Physician Scientist Track and Experimental Pathology. I have, I have a primary appointment in the Department of Pathology, but a secondary in the new Department of Artificial Intelligence and Human Health with strong interest in AI and machine learning, in addition to Neuropath. Eddie? Hi, I'm Eddie Lee from uh, University of Pennsylvania. I'm a neuropathologist there, uh, also co-director of our Institute on Aging. Um, let's see, I run our brain bank for our Alzheimer's Center, FTD Center, Movement Disorder Center, Connect TBI, which is a consortium for TBI research. Uh, also run a basic research lab studying basic mechanisms of neurodegeneration. And Julie. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Schneider. I'm at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center in Chicago. Um, and I am the neuropathologist for multiple epidemiologic studies, um, including minority aging research, as well as uh, other um, other groups that um, of minor that uh, of minorities, excuse me. I also have some interest in TBI and have been working a little bit with uh, Kristen Dams O'Connor, looking at this in a, from a population standpoint. All right, thank you all. Um, and Julie, I noticed I, you, you cut in and out a little bit. It may have just been on my end, but just as a for just in case, um, just as a heads up to, to try to stay close to your mic if you can. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I often have that problem too, so it's one I'm keenly aware of. And um, with that, Dirk, I think I'll ask you to, to kick things off and get our discussion started. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, hey, everybody. So I'll be I'll be pretty quick. I want to I want to thank. Um, the organizers, uh, uh, NINDS and, and Carlos and Rebecca for uh, inviting me to participate in this. I think it's really exciting. It's really timely. Um, uh, I'm uh, humbled to be a part of a, a really world-class panel of, of neuropathologists and neuroscientists here. And so I won't take a ton of time because I know we're all thinking about this and we're all trying to address ways that we can essentially solve these problems using the expertise that we have and the tools that we have in neuropathology and neuroscience. And imaging is um, really just absolutely going to be essential in translating what we find structurally at the microscopic level from a pathology perspective back into understanding uh, how, these, uh, how these disorders affect the brain more broadly and more importantly, diagnosing and treating these these disorders during life. So I'm I'm really I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'll just I'll just say I I I'm convinced that the solutions are in these brains that we're examining, right? Whether it's vascular dementia, whether it's uh, CTE or traumatic brain injury related pathologies, the answers are there, and we don't yet we haven't yet developed the tools or deployed the tools or the analytical techniques to really unlock the secrets of these people's brains. And so why is that? There's a lot of different challenges and I think that's the, uh, and opportunities. And I think that's the point of this discussion is to really try to understand from an imaging and pathology 
uh, integration perspective, how do we leverage one uh, to understand the other and vice versa? What are, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges? And so we've met as a group before this and sort of talked about the things that, are, that we think are probably important. And I think all of us have specific ideas. So it'll be good to, to, to hear from all of us. I'll just try to summarize the state of the, state of, uh, of the field, right? So um, we, for neuropathology, we, we, ha we rely on donors. And so where are these donors coming from? And the, so the first, the first challenge is to actually have uh, donors who are representative of the different communities. We've talked about diversity and opportunity and underrepresented uh, groups. And so that's a big issue, but also having donors that are really well characterized with anti-mortem imaging, like we've heard from, uh, from, from the speakers before. That, are, that have biofluid biomarkers, that have potentially cell lines that have been developed so that people, experimentalists, can be going in and testing hypotheses for mechanism on those cells derived from these patients, et cetera. And so the first challenge that we have is really just how do we, um, how do we access the donors that are gonna help us solve the answer? And, and part of the answer is through these different, through these different um, cohorts. We heard from uh, Abigail and NeuroBioBank NeuroBioBank has done a really, really great job in some aspects of uh, recruiting people for brain donation. Um, certainly, uh, you know, African-American representation, that's, that's really difficult, and they've done a really great job of that. And yet there's other aspects, for instance, in the Alzheimer's Center Network, where there may be much better clinical characterization. And so what we need to do is we need to, we need to maximize the opportunity for people to donate their brains, to open up the uh, to, to, to increase uh, awareness of brain donation for research and outreach and opportunities for people to donate their brains. The next issue is to, we, need to, we need to develop and deploy the tools that are necessary to really unlock the secrets that are in these brains. So I gave a very nice presentation uh, focused on immunohistochemistry and one of the tools that we're using and a lot of people on here, Brittany and many of us are using digital imaging analysis to try to to try to dive more deeply into the, the information that those tools can provide. There's a lot of other tools, single cell uh, and spatial omics, uh, digital spatial profiling, right? Biochemistry, cell lines and, and tissue culture that could be performed from these brains. And so what we really need to do is we really need to develop ways to optimize the availability of brain tissue from these donors that can be utilized for these different technologies as we continue to develop technology. So to marry optimized tissue collection and preservation techniques with the, with the assays that are gonna help glean the, help us identify the factors that are really important in the early progression for these disorders. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of us, including Julie, uh, have been really adamant about communication, right? We're, we're using different terminologies between pathologists and Im imagers in some ways, microinfarctus, brought up, it's a classic example of what is a microinfarct to a pathologist compared to an imager. But we really need better communication and terminology across the board, right? So, uh, so that spans uh, from cohorts, that spans from our disciplines, right? We, need, we really need to have a common language that we're using to describe these pathologies. And beyond that, harmonized, or some sort of common baseline practices and approaches. So how are we, we this was brought up with the NeuroBioBank, what are the pathological protocols for the NeuroBioBank? And how do those relate to say the Alzheimer's Center network or some of these other brain networks? And so we really should be working together better within our respective networks, like the Alzheimer's Center network, but also across these networks, which is a little bit more challenging because we're doing different things to really have standardized approaches, both from, and imaging, imaging uh, protocols, both ex vivo and uh, anti-mortem. Uh, and then of course the pathology protocols while not limiting our ability to innovate and to extend what we, what we do with our different specific sites. And so, and so like I said, I think, I think this encompasses barriers and, and opportunities, you're right. We need, we need better, uh, more representative donors. We need to communicate better. We need, um, we, need, we need more expertise. There's a shortage of neuropathologists and some of us have talked about that and, and ways to enhance that. And I know Eddie's been really involved in, in that. And then, and then of course, all of this requires funding and infrastructure. It requires fancy equipment, right? These MRIs, these, these MRI machines are not cheap. 
the, the, the genomics that we do are not cheap. And so we, it all comes back to funding and infrastructure and coordination across all of our groups. And I really believe if we, if we, uh, if we continue to do what we're doing and, and, uh, and keep our nose to the grindstone that we're gonna, we're gonna be able to figure out, uh, find some answers working together. So I'm gonna stop there. I know I'm, there's a ton of other ideas and opinions and I don't know if we take questions or how it works, but um, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Dirk. That that was great. I think um, you know, highlighted a lot of the some major areas for discussion. And I think you know I don't see any questions that have come into the chat yet. But I'd like what I'd like to do is uh, give your colleagues perhaps an opportunity to respond. Um, if someone has a, one of those four points that you really want to talk about first, feel free to go ahead. But otherwise, we could maybe perhaps um, you know think start off talking perhaps about communication either within neuropathology or um, you know, between the neuropathologies, pathologists and the imagers. Um, but can I bring up one thing? Absolutely, Julie. Okay, so I agree, um, you know, 100% with uh, Dirk's excellent presentation on what the um, opportunities, challenges are in the field. The, well, one of the things I wanted to add was this, the, not only the uh, character, characterization of, of um, their imaging prior to autopsy, but also their clinical characterization. So neurologic disease is very complicated. Somebody brought up autism and the spectrum. Cognitive impairment is very complicated. Motor impairment is very complicated. And in order to really move the field, I think we really need to be multidisciplinary and have clinicians also involved so that we know who it is that we're looking at and what their clinical symptoms were prior to death. I mean, that would be the ideal thing to have. Obviously, if you don't, there's still value in um, looking at the imaging and the neuropathology alone. But if you have that clinical information, you've just risen, you know, you've just taken that research and, and made it so much more valuable um, because we really are trying to characterize what's happening clinically in people. So, you know, whether or not they have cognitive impairment, you know, a control is very different when it's been, when the person has had some type of, uh, you know, examination versus has not. And so what a control is, I think it's very murky in some of these fields, especially neurologically. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I'd like to make the point that, um, we were, were asking, uh, Dirk and Julie brought up well-characterized uh, brain donors, but what we also want are controls and controls are not always in a longitudinal study. So what I see as a, as a major um, lack is that um, we don't have access to the families or the medical records uh, from these brain donors that come in. And especially for young brain donors, we, we tend to have better uh, control material if it's an aged person, but there's more and more emphasis on the early manifestations of neurologic disease, neurodegenerative disease. And we really need to focus on getting uh, access uh, to the medical records uh, next of kin on young individuals who were never part of a study because there was nothing wrong with them and they didn't expect to die. So, um, you know, I'd be all for that kind of initiative. If I could just yeah, add, I, I, oh, sorry, no. just real quick. We, we, I completely agree. And Anne, Anne's group is, and the NeuroBioBank are experts at going out across the country and being able to give people the opportunity for brain donation in all, air, all corners of the country. Um, but a lot of times these are folks who haven't been part of a study. And so to one of the barriers that we have is having sufficient prospective cohort studies that have the right controls enrolled. And yet for a lot of, especially traumatic brain injury work, you can't, you'd have to enroll a million people to have young people who are able to donate their, your brain. So you're always going to have to be uh, accessing medical examiners and other, and other mechanisms to be able to access these um, these control brains, and then, you know, Kristen Dams O'Connor, who's on here, has done a lot uh, with and a lot of other people in trying to maximize what we can learn post mortem. But it'll never replace. Which I agree with Julie. It'll never replace 
a, you know, a clinician and, and, a, and a structured exam and all the kinds of things that you can do in a prospective cohort trial. Can I chime in here too? Um, so it's super important to keep this clinical focus. Uh, you know, we're not collecting brains so that we can make them glow and, and do cool things with them. We really uh, have to focus on getting that clinical data because that's what we really care about in the end. And I'm really glad that you mentioned uh, Dr. Dams O'Connor. Uh, what she's doing with organizing common data elements, structured family interviews, these are going to be really, really important. You know, and I think the neurobiobank, uh, it's going to be important for them to start deploying some of these instruments. So to make our brains as valuable as possible, um, common, and this also touches on this idea of, are we speaking the same language? Are we collecting the same data across different centers, different studies? Um, yeah, super important. Rebecca, um, I wonder if um, I could comment on kind of the, the challenges of the, the workshop we're addressing today, which is namely how to integrate neuropathology with neuroimaging. Um, you know, the streamline that pipeline, I think is a challenging one. And some of the, some of the, uh, the challenges were outlined in the, in the excellent talks that were given earlier. Um, one thing that really hasn't been brought up is especially in prospective trials, the importance of rapid acquisition of brains and this is something that I think Dirk has, um, and I'm sure some of the other brain banks have, have sought to achieve, is you know, rapid autopsy, because the integrity and quality of the tissue is absolutely imperative. And also how that tissue is processed to maximize the number of studies that can be done with each of these precious resources, namely, you know, being able to do molecular studies, uh, immunohistochemical studies, and so forth. They require different types of tissue preservation. So I was wondering if Dirk could comment on that. And then the I, other I'm directors. Sure, I'm sure other, yeah, I'm sure other people. I'll just say briefly, that's been something that we've been focused, all of us focus on. Um, and, you know, the, the best tissue preservation may be different depending on the application. So if somebody is wanting to, uh, focus on tissue expansion, you know, clearing and expansion microscopy, you may want some a piece of tissue that's fixed in a certain way versus the single nucleus omics, uh, you know, single nucleus RNA-seq, you want it frozen in a certain way. And so we've been trying really hard in our group to figure out ways to get the imaging on these brains either directly. We've been working with Bruce Fischel and, and Eugenio Iglesias uh, with 3D scanning to try to get the kinds of information you can get on a fixed brain with an ex vivo scan. And so Christine McDonald has actually implemented a, um, she, she purchased a, uh, a rapid a portable MRI that, that we have in our autopsy suite now that we can get cadaveric scans uh, before, which take 45 minutes before we can actually, before we do the dissection, which is helping us get those well-preserved fresh frozen tissue samples. And so we have a strategy, I think a lot of us do. This is what I was sort of getting at in that, and the Neurobiobank is working on this with BICAN, but we should be at some level comparing these different approaches side by side. We all have different approaches. And it would be nice to have, I think somebody mentioned a, you know, a resource, like a protocol resource. It would be nice for us to go know if we're freezing in liquid nitrogen vapor versus you know, dry ice versus X, Y, or Z. How does that, what is the, what is the best or comparable way method for application X, Y, or Z. And so um, that's a big problem in the field and we're all sort of working on it. Um, and the newer techniques I suspect that come along, the new technologies probably will need us to do more things with the, with the tissue. So I'm sure other people, a lot of other people have an idea about this, but it's a really important issue to, to go quickly and get that tissue in one, in one, um, and you know optimally preserved for one thing but then also to try to get you know there's no replacement for an MRI to find white matter hyperintensities and if we have frozen tissue and no MRI or an MRI that was five years ago it's really hard to know what we've got as far as sampling for these 
um, frozen techniques for white matter hyperintensities. So I don't know. The application needs to be married with the stabilization and the and the and the dissection. I, I absolutely agree. I think that how we process tissue really depends on the application. And you know, postmortem interval might not matter if you're looking at protein aggregates, right? Because that will survive on the sidewalk for days, right? And and, and so I think there there are a lot of I worry a little bit about too much focus on postmortem interval because we know that there are a lot of other factors like agonal event, hypoxia, you know, uh, how somebody essentially passed away that matter a lot more than than postmortem interval. So if you die of an accident and you're in, you know, the middle of Minnesota in the middle of winter, your brain is going to be very preserved for a long time. Um, um, but it seems to me that. So my other thought was, I mean, talking about communication is um, we, we, some of us had a meeting with uh, a bunch of neuropathologists and MR physicists, right? And we're the ones in the weeds doing the technical work. Um, and it was amazing to me how we couldn't talk to each other. It was a meeting where the MR physicists would talk amongst themselves for 15 minutes and then the neuropathologists would talk for 15 minutes. And we just spoke a fundamentally different language that we didn't understand each other very well. Um, and I think that reflects that the techniques are different, right? The the resolution is different. Uh, what gives us contrast is different, right? We're using H and E, which is a chemical-based thing, or, or, or antibodies that bind to proteins, which is fundamentally different from M what MR MRI does. And it seems like the field right now is very focused on um, how can we apply MR techniques to postmortem tissue and ex vivo and do the correlations, which I think is great. And I think over the next decade, we're going to learn tons from that. The other thing to think about just bigger ideas is how do we take some of the techniques we use in neuropathology and expand that into neuroimaging? Meaning, you know, are there contrast agents we could develop that gets at the protein level, localization on an MR level? You know, uh, if you look at amyloid PET, for example, you know, the work that Clunk started in Pittsburgh, but, you know, Dan Skrivonsky, who was a neuropathologist, you know, developed Amivid, right? Uh, and that's going from histologic dyes that we use in pathology and transferring that to neuroimaging. And I think, I think um, there's less effort in that direction that I, that I see. And so having support in going both directions would be, would be useful, I believe. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Eddie. I wanted to follow up on, on one thing that you said, and you mentioned, um, you know, the challenges in communicating and the feeling that, that people are speaking a different language. And do you have thoughts about, you know, what, are, are there ways we might be able to help to address that, you know, either through yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave it open-ended, but, but what could help? Because I've been just trying to hang out with MR physicists more and just <laughs> understand what they're saying. Because some, I mean, just some of the words, I like have no idea what they mean. Um, you know, so almost like a crash course in, in how they're thinking. That's what I, I was wondering, have wondering if it's, it's sort of some, a little bit of sort of structure, some structured or semi-formal education to make it and then and then opportunities for discussion is what I'm hearing. I don't know if others have thoughts. Yeah, people want to chime in. So one of the places where I think it's really important and this came up, uh, Dirk had brought this up at one of our pre meetings, the idea of a common coordinate framework and neuroanatomy and defining brain regions in the same way. We have free surfer defined brain regions and neuroanatomists uh, define brain regions in a different way. I think neuropathologists probably define brain regions by tissue block and, you know, maybe differently across different labs. I think a, um, a dictionary, uh, a kind of ICD-9 code equivalent of, uh, you know, brain region uh, would be an amazing contribution. We could, um, we could all agree on what, what brain regions represent. Um, another, like, kind of analogy is, uh, or not an analogous, is uh, features, pathological features. Um, defining them in, in very, very specific ways and maybe numbering them so that a tangle, you know, defined in a certain way is, you know, this is this. Uh, there are going to be thousands and thousands of features that we're going to discover. There are known features. There are going to be new features that are going to be AI derived. And we're going to need to correlate uh, those features with the neuroimaging. So we need to, we need to get ahead of this before uh, before it's too late. Oh, I, I agree completely um, with the with the communication. Um, it's really a hindrance throughout imaging pathology world, and it it stems from um, the the imagers 
using pathologic, that I'm, so I'm not blaming the imagers, because we do the same thing pathologically, but there's, there's a tendency to use pathologic terms to describe what is being seen on the imaging. So small vessel disease equals white matter hyperintensity. Um, or, you know, it, it, other examples, you know, I, I'm sure I could think of, but those that comes to mind immediately. Um, or, or, you know, the, another example would be that somebody is amyloid positive. Well, amyloid positive doesn't mean that you don't, or negative does not mean you don't have amyloid in your brain. Many, many older people who are amyloid negative on scan have amyloid in their brain and quite a bit of it. So we, we have to be careful because what happens is the other researchers who are doing really cool stuff don't understand that. So they, they call and they say, well, give me an amyloid negative person. And, and us pathologists say, what do you mean by that? So they, they interpret what we're saying as the experts as being fact. So I think this, this idea of having um, some type of dictionary uh, where we combine and explain how we're talking about things and what it may or may not mean is important. Um, and it's, a, it's going to be a challenge, but I think we, we have to start somewhere. And that I do think that that would be big help in the field. Thank you. And I just, um, I just want to call attention to a comment in the chat, um, which was a call for a fellowship in neuroimaging and neuropathology. And then also I see that um, one of our colleagues, a neuropathologist from the data analytics group has, has joined us. So I want to give her the uh, opportunity to speak up as That's well. That's such an interesting thing because we do get neurologists coming to the brain bank and doing projects, but I've, I've never seen a neuroradiologist come into any at Columbia or here at Mount Sinai, but maybe it's happening at other centers. Are the neuroradiology fellows all over your brain banks just itching to do projects? That's a problem. This is, hi, I don't know if you can hear me. This is Rebecca Folkers. I'm the one who put that comment in the chat. Um, years ago when I was at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and working closely with Bruce Fischel and his group, we kind of bounced that around like, wouldn't it be great if we could have a fellowship where uh, those interested in this kind of, you know, um, complementary or further investigations could um, spend time with the neuroradiologist directly looking at cases, learning the terminology, and with the neuropathologist, and that somehow this would create a bridge. I the longer I do this, the more essential I feel that this is. I have no idea how one would go about it, but if somebody has some money to do it and we can have a couple centers and that we put together a program where people go, you know, two months here, two months there, whatever, I would be really, really pleased to help do something like that if anyone else were interested and we had a way to get money to do it just by two cents. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, well, that's- Can we go back to the, the can we go, oh. there was a comment I wanted to make about the um, tissue preservation. Um, can I go back to the, just really quickly? Um, sure. I think neuroimaging and neuropathology, it's like a great example of the tension, right? There's a lot of interest in, in molecular characterization on the cellular level with the uh, brain initiative, we want to make maps. And so uh, in order to do that, we are going to use lots of different antibodies and different RNA probes and so on. However, in order to get these ex vivo scans, we have to leave the brains in fixative for quite a bit of time to avoid uh, this, uh, this artifact that goes along with uh, the slow diffusion of the fix into the brain, right? So if this is the problem that I, I haven't figured out how to solve, if I have to leave the brain in formalin for four weeks, five weeks to get rid of the artifact, then I've killed a lot of my RNA, um, or at least degraded it uh, quite a bit. Maybe for a high abundance uh, species, it's fine, but for rare things, I think it could be a real problem. So I, I don't know how to get around that. Uh, it's come up at other meetings, the idea of perfusion fixation. We've been playing around with that a lot in the lab. It's not that easy, um, but I, I think this is going to be really important coming up with ways to preserve 
this large organ um, that you know that's just not easy to get fixed into the middle. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's a solution to that. But, and along oh, those same um, lines, I was just going to say along those same lines, how do we cut the brain? Uh, what's the best way to cut the brain so that you know we can correlate um, with the radiologists? I certainly, uh, you know, I use the standard coronal, and that's not what they use. Yeah, I saw, I saw in the chat and multiple other people do this. Um, we can now do the ex vivo MRI and create 3D printed molds. So we could cut really relatively close and, and register with whatever field you decide or whatever orientation you decide. So there are ways. It's not, it, there's still tissue warping and other things that happen. It's not perfect, but um, those, those things are coming online. What we've done uh, in collaboration with with Dirk at UW is we have serially sectioned the brain so that slabs of tissue that are very uniformly and systematically collected from brain to brain are then uh, individually fixed. So you get around that problem of, of fixative uh, penetration. You can also select the kind of fixative you want for that particular application. So for example, much of the work that I do in my lab uh, we prefer to work with paraformaldehyde as opposed to formalin because it, it optimizes a lot of the uh, antigens that we're studying. And so uh, we have very strict protocols on the concentration of paraformaldehyde, how long it stays in paraformaldehyde, when it's switched out into, into PBS, for example. We have adjacent sections that are uh, flash frozen so that those can then be used to correlate with for various molecular or omics studies. Uh, so I think there are ways around those sorts of problems. Um, also, if I could just take a moment to um, you know, address Rebecca Folkert's question about the need for a fellowship in this area. Um, I think it's important to recognize that even though neuropathology seems to be this very uh, mysterious discipline um, in the sense that you know you have highly trained neuropathologists who collect these brains, who have special stains that they use uh, to figure things out and make their diagnoses, that in essence, any of us can do this kind of work. There's not a big difference between taking a rat brain and studying it and studying a human brain, um, as long as you work closely with your neuropathologist. I mean, I've been doing this now for about 30 years and Becky Folkerth and I were in the same lab at Boston. And early on when we were trying to crack some difficult problems with getting antibodies to work at human brain, and much to their horror, you know, I brought a rat brain into the lab and said, well, let's optimize this first in the rat, then let's take this into the human. And that was the beginning of my close relationship with neuropathologists over the years. So I like for all the, you know, the, the neurobiologists who might be listening in on the call and the neuroimagers who are thinking, well, this is way beyond what I can possibly do, you know, because I'm not trained in neuropathology. Um, at the end of the day, if you're trained as a neurobiologist, I think you can do this kind of research. And it just takes a lot of commitment and dedication to the particular challenges that the human brain imposes uh, to do um, you know, prospective studies, which require large scale you know, statistical analyses and so forth and so on. Dirk, were you going to... I was just going to say Parthas had his hand up for a really I, long time. Yes, I, yes, I was actually just about to go over there and 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 uh, acknowledge him. I know he's been waiting very patiently. So Partha, thank you. I'm sorry, sorry, thank you. I just wanted to, first of all, quickly, um, uh, I'll talk about it maybe tomorrow, but I put a chat in, uh, put a link in the chat. Uh, we've been funded, thank you, NIH, uh, responding to the CCF need to do a multimodal atlas that will actually bridge neuroradiology and neuropathology. So we'll be gathering post-mortem MRI, admittedly, you know, uh, hemibrains, 
whole brains and H and E, which is the um, you know the uh, the bread and butter of neuropathology. I really would like to speak to the need for that connection between the two communities. I I'm a physicist by training, so I have no fear jumping between communities. I'm neither a neuropathologist nor a well. I actually did my PhD on on MRI, but um, uh, I I really think that that's a great need. You know, the, the fact that this symposium is happening is fantastic because. Uh, these folks don't, they really need to talk to each other. I want to say that it's a bigger gap just between anatomic pathology and the rest of biomedical sciences, because I, I find that anatomic pathology is pennies on the healthcare dollar, very important for, for diagnosis. Um, the front end folks often are unaware that it even exists. So there's a person in the back office, you know, there's a charnel house where little bits of tissue are being cut. Uh, put into blocks of paraffin and, um, you know, somebody's looking at it under the scope, uh, everybody sees, you know, um, uh, beautiful brain images. Nobody, you know, looks at these h and &E images. So I, I'd really like to support that. And one of our charges, and I'm really happy to be part of this discussion, is to help bring those communities together. Um, so we are trying to build an atlas. We'd love, I, I, I just wanted to uh, take the <laughs> opportunity to reach out to everyone on this call and say, we are trying to build those bridges. Please reach out to me. You know, I just want to make a plea that yes, these two, two communities should talk. We are, we are trying. So uh, just putting my hand up there and saying, you know, please reach out if you're interested in that dialogue. We are collecting a correlative data set we'll make available to everyone. Uh, but uh, yeah, wanted to acknowledge that communicative need. There was one aspect of what you just said that I thought was fascinating, which is that nobody sees the slides in the neuropathology, but they see the MRI. Um, one of the things that I guess might be the reason why we're even having this meeting today is the advent of neuropathology, digital pathology and digital neuropathology, that we're now able to scan the slides. They're still huge files, but there, when, there might be a day when you go to your doctor and they give you your, your biopsy on a slide and you can take the digital slide home with you, just like you're taking your MRI home with you on a slide, um, because we're not giving slides to patients, glass slides to patients, but we can always copy that data. And so these images are now going to scatter. Everybody's going to have access to them because we can copy them really cheaply. We're going to solve this database problem. We're going to solve the repository problem. It's going to be multiple petabytes. We're going to have data. Uh, that's you know more data than the web uh, telescope, right? Uh, the file size is going to be larger when we digitize. Absol all absolutely, absolutely. We'll get the range. data dropping from the from the uh, you know James Webb, and you know we we uh, I've spent countless uh, nights up late looking at uh, you know histological <laughs> image data. It's also beautiful yeah. and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, I think that the, probably one of the most exciting things to me, and this came up in in the uh, in the presentations before this, um, how to quantify these these changes and these pathologies. And I don't think we're going to be able to do it without AI. And all of our brain banks really need to be tricked out with the latest. We need to be able to handle lots and lots of specimens. We're still kind of um, in the stone age and many of our brain banks, some of us are, some are well ahead of all the others, but we need to be able to barcode every single block and every lesion and to be able to track every specimen so that we can then get hundreds or thousands of, of lesions and then correlate them. And they need to be, the neuroimagers and the investigators are gonna need to be able to find and pull those little lesions and find the blocks easily. And right now we don't really have an easy way to do that. This idea of like a common coordinate framework, I'm just gonna say one more thing and then I'm gonna stop talking, um, I think is really exciting. So we could map our blocks to this framework. We get the MRI, we map and we bring the lesions together. But I'm almost wondering if we might be doing it in the wrong way. Do we need to develop software so we can just take our, our histology slides and just map that up against the MRI? Um, just direct co-registration, because I don't know of an easy solution to do co-registration right now. If I may quickly jump in and say that's you like hit upon one of my grant specific aims, which we are trying to pursue, which is try to, if you have an image and you have a database of images, I could pattern match that image. If that set of images are co-registered to MRI, now you're back, you know, to, to the Atlas space. That, that's exactly you know, we are so, you know, love to chat offline. Yeah. Bruce? 
Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, as Dirk knows, we're doing exactly that with Dirk and with uh, Christine McDonald. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that they're doing the ultra low field scan so that we can do it on both fixed tissue and fresh tissue. So we routinely register in vivo atlases to the ex vivo uh, data and project it onto the, the, um, uh, the ex vivo data for Dirk to guide um, blocking and this kind of thing. So I just want to make a point. I think that's amazing. But is there a software package that anybody can download? Is it on the GitHub? And I can give it to my radiolo neuroradiology fellow and I can give them an, an SV file from my Aperio scanner and they can just do it. Or is it still, you know, has to be done in a specialized setting? Because if it's not, yes, it's not like mass produced, it's not going to get, it's not going to happen in our brain banks. Well, I was just going to say yes to all that up to the point where you said, and then they can just do it. So getting to that point is a giant amount of work, you know, like getting yeah. things working on some cases is hard, but getting it working for everyone everywhere in the world is a massive software endeavor. And one of the things that, you know, I'm of course biased in this regard, but I think it's something that NIH rarely funds uh, and it, it would be a great investment of resources. Yeah, if, if I could just chime in on uh, several things um, uh, with, um, with respect to the um, to the bigger picture, with with in terms of imaging and, and path, I think there's two really really important applications that we should be doing as much as we can as soon as we can. The first one is to be using imaging, whether it's anti mortem or ex vivo or cadaveric or whatever, to help identify lesions or other things that we can't see as pathologists in the brain so that we can start to understand. And white matter hyperintensities are the classic example. And then the other part is to Partha's point and to Bruce, you know, we as, and John brought this up, we as pathologists are pretty crude with respect to the anatomy that we use to designate certain things. And so one of the most important things that we do in brain banking is to provide tissue for research to investigators all over the place. And when an investigator wants a specific part of the brain, the more specific they can be and the more accurate the neuropathologist can be is actually getting that using these common coordinate frameworks as a, an overlay to go back to our, our samples and find those areas will be, I think will be, will go a long way to, to um, at least reducing a lot of the variability that we're probably seeing across research right now, because, you know, if we're, if we're just sampling dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, well, that's a lot of, that's a lot of highway. So, um, so I think those are the two really important parts of the, of the imaging and path that we, sh we are certainly trying to do now uh, in our, in our bank and, and, and getting those ex vivo scans, I think, and Swati showed some of this, as a bridge to the to the antemortem to what was happening in that person before they died has been a wonderful tool that uh, Christine and you know and Bruce and lots of people have been able to use to try to to try to bridge to path. So so to the extent that that there was a focus need for for sites to have more access to getting those ex vivo scans, I think that could be a, an investment that would that would pay dividends. Thank you, Dirk. Um, so we are running out of time on our session, but we started late. So I think that I might give us a few more minutes for discussion. There have been a couple of comments or questions in the chat that I'd like to, to mention and then give folks another opportunity if, if anyone on the panel has more they'd like to say. Um, there was a question in the chat um, asking to hear the panel's thoughts on the connection in TBI between white matter changes in, in, on MR. Um, maybe oxidal pathology and neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative pathologies such as tau and amyloid. Um, it's sort of a little bit more of a detail-oriented question. I don't know if anyone has any, any thoughts on that. I think in some ways, like that's the opportunity. Yeah. Like if we get, the better we get at building this technology, this is uh, Doug, how are you doing, Doug? Um, yeah, the best, better opportunity, yeah. Once we have all of this in place, we'll get really good answers to this and tons of other questions. And, and it, it acknowledges that, I, I think most of the neuropathologists would say that we're not excellent at cerebral vascular disease or white matter disease. Um, and the hope is that neuroimaging can make us better. 
<laughs> and identify the things that they're seeing that that we could diagnose postmortem. Um, um, so I don't think I don't think we know what we're supposed to be looking for, what stains to do, for example, what what that means yet. Um, but hopefully we get there soon. Thank you. I think the, the other thing to bring up is that. Um, there are things that you see on imaging that are going to have multiple etiologies. And, you know, if you look, white matter hyperintensity is our classic one, right? So, um, as you know, that they can represent a lot of different things in the brain. As far as how you would know a, what is vascular versus what is degenerative versus what is demyelinating versus, I mean, I, I think you know, ultimately it'd be great to have those mechanisms, but it might not just be one imaging method that'll tell us that, at least currently. Um, so we also have to, you know, not limit expectations, but recognize that one thing that you see on that scan might not be sufficient to tell us what the underlying pathology is. One, I think um, there's another kind of concept too that Eddie brought up about how we're not very good at assessing white matter. We're not very good at assessing cerebrovascular disease. I'm really putting my money on machine learning to help us do this better. Um, and I want to toot my own horn. We have a manuscript uh, that we put in bioarchives uh, just recently. Andy McKenzie is the uh, person that's the first author. Um, we were really, really impressed with uh, the multiple instance learning algorithm when we trained on cognitive impairment with how well it picked up on abnormalities in the white matter, um, strongly correlated, very, very strongly correlated with cognitive impairment in our aging cohort. So uh, things that are hard, I think, are going to get a lot easier, and we're going to be able to do it high throughput. So I think that's probably worth putting a lot of effort okay we're gonna i think we're gonna need to do this collaboratively into creating algorithms machine learning algorithms the challenge here is you have to train the algorithms and you need annotated data sets so every there's lots of people who know how to run these algorithms but it's up to us as the neuropathologist to create the annotated data sets um, that's been the real barrier that i've come across and i would just add that it isn't just identifying lesions on mr and then knowing what the pathology is, I'm seeing lesions on pathology that I want to know how best to image them during life. So I want to do ex vivo imaging to, to you know, find out how, how do we pick up on these pathologies that we're seeing under the microscope. So it's a two-way street, not just one way. Yeah, no, absolutely something that goes both ways. And I think uh, Suzanne has raised her hand and she had a comment in the chat that I was just hoping to get to. So I don't know if you were gonna bring that up, Suzanne, or something else, but go ahead. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, I was gonna comment on John's point that he just brought up about AI, if I may, because um, um, we've been trying to also, also use AI to quantify histopathological markers in our samples. And one of the biggest challenges we, we run into now is really like you can train your data set and then validate it with your own data. But then if you wanna apply it to an outside data set or, or collaborate with other, then it doesn't work at all. So it's it's almost like you build your AI and then you want to uh, share and, and sort of uh, validate on different different types of data. And if it's only acquired a little bit differently in a different slide scanner or a different type of hematoxylin even, then it doesn't work anymore. So how I would love to hear you guys' thoughts on how how can we overcome that challenge if we wanted to collaborate more? We're going to have to get serious about it. We've um, been tar far too tolerant in letting the different brain banks do whatever they want to do. You look at your tangles with a phospho tau, you look with a silver, you look with thioflavin. Um, I think unless we get strict about it, we have to use the same hematoxylin reagents, we have to have the same QC metrics. Unless we do that, it's not gonna be comparable across center. They would never let us get away with this if this was in a CLIA certified laboratory. But, but, but MR scanners have similar issues, right? Where it, well, from scanners, yeah. so I, I don't, I, more homogeneity will help but I think training sets have to be more diverse, right? Because if you, I, I think there's gonna be some noise and we have to reach some kind of medium where people do try to use the same antibodies, for example, but I think the heterogeneity is gonna be there. And so, so it's all about the training set. If you train on one data set, it doesn't apply to others. So you need both data sets to train on. Um, so, but, but that means getting a centralized resource somehow. Um, and so these common repositories and, data sharing and digital slides is, 
is yeah. so important. Yeah, just because you yeah. do the same antibody doesn't mean you get the yeah. same, <laughs> the same result, all. right? The yeah. processors and how you're fixing the tissue, all those things make it make a difference. And the other thing that's really important to just keep in mind, um, and Dirk brought this up, is that we don't want to stifle in innovation. You know, we don't want people not using the latest and greatest because they have to harmonize with uh, what everyone else is doing. So yeah. it, it really is truly a balance. So some, some of our studies, we have um, um, participants take the, the MR scans so that they can harmonize with other groups. And then they do our scans, which are we think are better and get more. Right? So <laughs> it's hard because we have to do the dumbed down scan to fit everybody else's, you know, so. Not dumbed down, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have said it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And it looks like there, um, yeah, another comment in the chat about about modern AI and and um, both the need to that just I think as you guys were saying the need to balance um, classical techniques with with AI and the different approaches. Um, Carlos, I see you've popped up. Did you have something to? Yeah, to I had I had a question for Eddie. So you mentioned right the you know using your scans because you think they're better, and then having to acquire the you know, dumbed down or simpler scans, is that, is that barrier that you encounter due to a lack of, I guess, more modern scanners at the other facilities that don't have the capabilities or the gradients or whatever to do, to do what you're doing? Or is it just a reluctance um, from the other sites to do those scans or maybe just translating from like Siemens to Philips to GE? Or I, what, think, what I think it's see? all of those. It, it kind of depends on how big the consortia is. I think the bigger the consortia, the more you have to have methods that are applicable to all the centers. And so things like scanner, like having a 7T versus a 3T or, or things like that matter. Um, I, I, I don't do the neuroimaging. My impression is that a lot of the specialized sequences are asking very specific questions, um, which are supplemental. Um, but I think all those things are, are, are at play. The, the other thing to keep in mind is that technology is advancing so rapidly that when you try to harmonize into what's happening today, it's already changing. And so there's going to be a better, better method available within a year. And so we have to find out, we, we, we need ways to allow for science to continue to evolve and not get stifled because of this harmonization. I think it. I think it comes back to um, communication and uh, and and collaboration, right? So, uh, John, a lot of people brought this up. You know, just the ability to share information freely and in a um, in an efficient manner. So, you know, I go back to the neurobiobank. Um, they've done a nice job with respect to their tissue holdings and the ability for researchers to actually go and see what they have. That's an example of, of, a, of, and most of us don't do that as far as the other brain banks. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but you know, having the ability to access scanned, scanned images from, from different cases, and I know, um, you know there's the Digital Imaging Working Group, Brittany Duggar and Melissa Murray and other people are working on that. There's similar efforts in the MRI realm there's these different networks that, um, that are focused on a specific disease or a specific diagnosis with respect to neuropathology and neuroimaging. The more that I think we can, we can communicate and harmonize without stifling innovation and, 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 and being nimble enough to keep up with things, which maybe, as Julie says, that may be a real challenge. But the more we can do that and work together to, um, to continue to advance, but be able to, to share resources together, share knowledge, share data, share tissue, um, that's going to really facilitate ex outstanding research. And so I think, you know, there's an effort underway between the Alzheimer Centers and the Neurobiobank that I'm a part of that uh, I'm excited about because it gives the Alzheimer Centers the potential to connect with the Neurobiobank to support the Neurobiobank, but using the expertise of the Alzheimer Centers to sort of take some of the burden off of the Alzheimer's disease, neuropathology, brain donation uh, from the Neurobiobank. I mean, I think if we, if we work together without without trying to centralize and harmonize everything, which would just stifle everything, will be, it'll, it'll work out. I think it'll help move things forward. 
I, I think if we look at the biomarker field, they've done a great job at coming out with, this is a standard protocol. We realize that some centers might not be able to do everything perfectly, but but you should collect in these tubes. You should, you know, I think guidelines are, are extremely helpful as a starting point um, without mandating anything. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and on the topic of biomarkers, uh, Clint put a top uh, a comment in the chat that he'd like to see more combining of fluid biomarkers with imaging to predict pathology. And I wanted to see if the panel had some any thoughts on that um, and how that might influence the neural path work that you're doing. Sorry, I, 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 think, I, just, I don't Julie, want to speak for everyone. Oh, go ahead, Clint. Uh, I, sorry, Julie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I just wanted to say, in addition to that, I wanted to get back to the idea that we have all of these really well characterized data sets from cohort studies that have been going on for years and years with a lot of pre-mortem imaging as well as you know other types of samples. Um, and I just wonder how we could encourage more collaboration, you know, with those with those studies to to bring them to bear to the work that you guys are are focused on. Sorry to interrupt you, Julie. No, no, no. I, I... 100% agree. And I think a lot of us on this call are already doing that. Um, I think biomarkers are the future of diagnosis and they're exciting. Um, what, what needs to be done, similar to with in vivo MRI, is we need to have these measures proximate to death. And one of the issues has been that it's very expensive that with the blood biomarkers, I think we have an opportunity now um, to get longitudinal bloods where we can then compare it to um, pathology. But I think that, that um, it, I think that is coming. I mean, I think most of us are trying to do, to do that, recognizing the importance of the in vivo biomarkers. A very practical thing is, if you have a resource, a database that links everything together, people will be able to use that data. I think, so at Penn, we have one database that has all of our biomarkers, our all our neuropathology, our all our neuroimaging and neurosecond. And it's, it's just begging people just to look at the data, which people can do. I, I think if that's not available on a more global scale, it just, the, the activation energy to be able to pull the imaging with the biomarker data and the pathology, that, that the little barrier is, um, impedes progress, right? I think if it's centralized somehow and it's all connected with a common good or what, however you do it, really I have to it. chime in here. That is probably one of the biggest barriers is ways to organize uh, neuropath data and to link it with other things. We don't have a limbs, off the shelf limbs for neuropathology. It's really easy. There are tons of things for CSF or any any fluid biomarker, but neuropathology <coughs> is just complicated enough. Actually, I think neuropathology is probably probably the most complicated. Or studying these brain diseases in general, all of the approaches, probably the most complicated medical research endeavor out there. There's so many different types of data that we're trying to integrate. I don't think it gets any more difficult than this, and that's probably why there's no off the shelf limbs to do it. I'm so jealous of the limbs that they have at Penn. Um, I don't know if, can you sell that? Can you, um, you know, license it to I mean, us? I, I, I'm pretty, I, our data core has shared our, our stuff with several centers already, so. But really quick though, Eddie, just to make the point, how long did it take you to build that database? <laughs> just just for the decades, record. Decades, yeah, decades. It started a long, long time ago. Yeah. And it started with simple things, just like, cataloging antibodies and a few pathology diagnoses and just built it over layers and layers over over decades. And if we want if we want to harmonize across all the different brain banks too, because we want these big data sets, um, we're going to need to have shared kind of information platforms. And so this is another huge problem. Well, on a national scale, yeah, things like that. Everybody has a homebrew yeah. limbs that they're, you know, keeping together with band-aids and, and, and paper clips or whatever. It's not, it's not sustainable. Uh, apropos of the limbs problem or uh, something that Abigail mentioned uh, in terms of uh, using ICD-10, uh, that's perfectly good for uh, clinical diagnoses, but for neuropaths, we don't even have a common set of uh, diagnostic language or a coding system that can be used. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I think that gets back to one of the one of the points about I mentioned earlier about the, the need to, to define, you know, define what's what's being worked with. Um, so we are we are nearing the end of our session. Carlos said we could have a couple more minutes, but I do think we need to wind down. Um, any any last questions or final comments that people would like to share uh, before we before we move on, I believe, to a brief break. I bet they all have more to say, but we're all biting our tongues because we. I know. I'm sure there's but I so much really more to say. Go ahead. Thank you so much for organizing it. Thank, thank you all for participating. It really has been, um, I think, a, a tremendously helpful and thoughtful session that's given us a lot more to think about as we as we move forward in the day and then beyond the workshop as well. So thank you hey, all very much. Yes, Stark. Hey, I just wanted to make one last point, and this is more to the folks who are organizing and funding the big studies. Um, you know, for future, for the future, considering um, including uh, autopsy endpoints in prospective cohort trials, especially for TBI and some of that is, I think, really important. I, I've seen some of that, but, you know, a lot of the really big neurodegenerative uh, trials, don't, et cetera, don't have autopsy as an endpoint. And so I think if I had to, if I had to say one thing that would really facilitate this kind of research, especially in trials where there's biomarker imaging, biofluid endpoints, sign those folks up for autopsy and fund that at the beginning, instead of us having to scramble sort of afterwards to go find people who've been in clinical trials or who or, or to build something uh, from an autopsy endpoint uh, after the, the study has started and, and been funded. I think that's the most important or the last point I would make. Thank you, Derek. I, I agree with you. I think that is a, a really important area for future consideration and I appreciate you bringing it up. All right, well, as I said, thank you all. Um, I really appreciate your efforts, both uh, in leading up to the workshop today and, and during the past um, hour plus. And I think with that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Carlos, who I think may be taking us out to a break. Is that right, Carlos? Yep, that's right. So yeah, th thank you all for that. That was, as Rebecca said, very helpful and insightful. There's definitely many common themes that I think you know are arising here, mostly with, with respect to data sharing and common sort of uh, use of language or terminology so that everybody can communicate <laughs> um, in a in an easier fashion or more uh, you know just a more understandable way um, with each other, um, as well as you know, having, as George just mentioned, just having the right types of studies, having the right types of patients at the right endpoints. We've definitely been talking about, um, you know, how do we add neuropathology or, or autopsies to these very large ep epidemiology studies that we do fund. So yeah, lots of things for us to consider. Um, and also things that we'll discuss further during the breakout sessions. But for now, um, we're gonna take a 15 minute break. So from 3.20 to 3.35, uh, we'll be on break and then we'll return and have the discussion with the imaging folks. So, yep, see y'all at 3.35. All right, welcome back everyone. So we're now gonna move on, as I mentioned before, to the in vivo and ex vivo imaging group and Antinioma, who's a TBI program director in INDS, uh, will be moderating that group um, and Constantinos Arfanakis uh, will be the lead. So I'll hand it over to Ensign. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, so as Carlos mentioned, I'm Ensigni Umo, a TBI program director at NINDS. And I want to just uh, briefly start with introductions. So I'll ask all the panelists to keep their introductions uh, as brief as possible. And we'll start with our session lead, Constantinos. Hi, I'm Konstantinos Arfanakis. Uh, I'm a professor in biomedical engineering at the Illinois Institute of Technology and also core leader of the Biomarker Neuroimaging Core at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center at Rush University Medical Center. And I'm interested in the development of uh, markers of age-related neuropathologies and uh, also the development of brain atlases. Thank you. And Bruce? Hi, I'm Bruce Fischel. I'm at Mass General Hospital. I'm a professor of radiology. Uh, I do neuroimaging, neuroimage analysis, and optical microscopy. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Dan Benjamini. 
Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Dan Benjamini uh, from the NIA. Uh, I'm the chief of the uh, multi-scale imaging and uh, uh, integrative uh, biophysics uh, unit. And I'm interested in uh, looking into biomarkers for uh, aging and uh, relating um, MR and uh, histo histopathology. Thank you. All right, I'll move on to Larry. Hi, I'm Larry Latour, an intramural scientist uh, in NINDS studying acute stroke and traumatic brain injury uh, in humans, and I'm interested in uh, MR-targeted uh, pathology to better describe uh, what we see. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Manis? Yeah, thanks. I'm Manis Donahue. I am a professor of neurology at Vanderbilt Medical Center, and our work is focused on developing new imaging methodologies, mostly MRI, to look at um, neuropathology. Um, and also cerebral physiology, mostly in vivo, but now also ex vivo as well. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I'm Peter Basser, and I uh, am wearing two hats. One is a PI at the National Institutes of uh, Child Health and Human Development, and another is a core director of the uh, Neuro uh, Radiology Neuropathology Integration Corps, uh, which is part of DOD. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Sean. Sean Whitehead, I'm an associate professor and neuroscientist at Western University. Uh, my interests uh, lie in integrating multimodal imaging using postmortem MRI, histopathology, and molecular imaging using mass spectrometry. Thank you. Susan? Hi, everyone. I, um, my name is Susanna Monvedu. I'm a trained neuroscientist and now assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Mass General Hospital in Boston. And our team uses in vivo and ex vivo imaging tools and neuropathology to study cerebral small vessel disease. Thank you. And Swati? Hi, everyone. I'm Swati Rani Lewandowski. I'm a biomedical engineer and associate professor in radiology at the University of Washington. And my work focuses mostly on in vivo and ex vivo neuroimaging to uh, better characterize cerebrovascular disease in degenerative diseases. Thank you, Swati. And with that, I'll hand it over to Constantinos to kick things off and get us started. Thank you, Sini. Um, well, we have uh, uh, a number of issues that we've uh, discussed in uh, preceding calls uh, to this meeting. Um, a number of issues uh, which makes the schedule uh, quite tight. And uh, I, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, at the start of this uh, session. Uh, all I wanted to remind uh, is that uh, we're here to discuss the combination of uh, post-mortem and in vivo imaging with uh, pathology. Uh, there is a lot of uh, things that we can learn about disease processes and mechanisms by combining uh, ex vivo MRI and pathology. And then with the correct translation to in vivo, uh, we can come up with uh, imaging markers of the different uh, pathologies that we can use, uh, hopefully in vivo. Um, so, this whole process that uh, is described in one sentence uh, in involves many, 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 many steps and uh, uh, very few of them are easy. Um, so uh, there are a number of items that uh, we would like to discuss uh, today uh, that have been raised by the panelists. Um, and uh, we welcome questions from uh, the audience uh, also in uh, the chat. And then we also have some time uh, towards the end of uh, the session um, for questions where you can raise your hand and you can turn on your camera and your mic and you can uh, ask uh, questions uh, or provide your comments. Um, so some of the uh, issues that we would like to discuss today have uh, already been uh, discussed uh, to some degree, uh, but I would like also to, to hear um, the imaging version of the answers to these questions. Uh, so the, the, the first uh, issue that uh, we have uh, decided uh, would be important to discuss, obviously, uh, is how do we get access to these brains, right? And we heard about the brain banks, uh, et cetera. And we all know how important the PMIs are, the postmortem intervals are to be short. 
we all know that it's great to have well-characterized individuals while they're still in life uh, so that uh, we know a lot of things about them uh, and so on. And we also mentioned that it's good to have uh, in vivo uh, MRI. And I'd like to point out that the uh, in vivo uh, MRI is important uh, because when we combine ex vivo MRI with pathology and we try to translate this to in vivo, at that point we want to have in vivo and ex vivo imaging on the same people, uh, not on people that come from the same group, have the same demographics, etc. We want the exact same uh, people to have in vivo MRI um, and uh, ex vivo MRI. And of course, we want the anti mortem interval. Uh, to be very short, not only the post-mortem interval, but the anti-mortem interval to be very short. Um, so ideally, we would like to have imaged someone just before death uh, and then after uh, death and yet uh, co combine the two images and do the translation from in vivo uh, to ex vivo. Um, so at this point, I would like to open this up to uh, the panel and uh, ask this question. How do we get more people to donate their brain, but not just to donate their brain and have uh, long anti uh, short uh, post-mortem intervals, et cetera, but how do we get those people that we have in vivo MRI and ex vivo MRI and the in vivo MRI is done very close to death? How do we address this problem? It's a very hard uh, problem, but um, it, it's, it, um, uh, the, the NIH is uh, basically looking for uh, um, ways to help us. So the question here is how do we um, how do we set up uh, a program where we can actually get people to donate their uh, brain for an MRI scan shortly before that? What are the diseases? Let's say what are the uh, situations? Let's describe it uh, generally where we can make this happen. Looks like the pathologist has some opinions here. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, my understanding for some of the amyloid PET studies that were very early is that the, NI, um, the FDA said you have to have postmortem validation that your amyloid PET works. And many companies were like, that's impossible, right? Like, we're gonna have to follow these patients forever. Um, I, I believe one tech that was done was that they enrolled uh, people in hospice um, and there, there are ethical issues around that, but people were willing to get scanned knowing that their life, they're in hospice um, and you're able to get imaging. Uh, they consented for autopsy and you're able to do that correlation there. So just raising that, that I believe is what happened for Emily Pet. Great point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll follow that up, Eddie. That's, that was my point. It was the, the AVID trials particularly would enroll people that were in hospice with a life expectancy of less than six months. And they would, they would do the PET. And then if they lived longer than the six months, they would redo, they would, they would scan them again uh, with the expectation that they would die. And a lot of these people had cancer. And, and I just wanted to add on, and uh, you know, Bruce, Bruce knows about this. We, we have a, a grant that is um, <clears throat> with the, for BICAN, where we proposed to uh, enroll people who are in hospice who don't have neurological involvement by their disease, which is probably going to be challenging, uh, to actually to actually enroll them for functional imaging as well as uh, as well as other imaging modalities, because of that. What Constantino says is so important to have that imaging before death, and when we talk about being able to pinpoint specific brain regions with respect to function, right? That's, that's, that's an even harder thing to do than just focusing on structure. And so the plan that um, Bruce and some other people put together with us was to um, enroll people in hospice with the expectation that they'll be, they'll die within six months um, and, uh, and get functional imaging to, in order to, to essentially localize different functional aspects of their neuroanatomy so that those can be uh, dissected for um, single cell transcriptomics, that sort of thing for BICAN. And so we'll see how hard that is. We haven't done it yet. We have IRB approval though. So we've navigated the ethics of it, I think pretty well. And, um, and there is precedent with the, with the PET, the AVID trials and some of these other PET trials. And so that's one way. The other way that I can see as a neuropathologist, which is pretty crude, would be 
to just scan lots and lots of people who have consented to autopsy every six months with the expectation that at some percentage of them will pass away and that's going to that's prohibitively expensive yes uh, excellent points I, I would like to point out uh, uh, something based on what Dirk just said that uh, uh, it's very important to realize that following this strategy which is the most typical strategy that uh, all of us uh, follow basically uh, image people over time uh, and uh, as long as they have signed an AGA uh, at some point we will get uh, we will get their brain into pathology uh, one bias that comes uh, to play that uh, people that are healthier will tend to have shorter anti-mortem intervals um, because at some point they may die of some reason that um, um, was not uh, something that causes them to die immediately after uh, immediately after uh, their scan uh, but people that may be more frail um, for, uh, for for different reasons may drop out of these longitudinal scans and they may have longer anti-mortem intervals um, and when we collected their image their image may be a view of the brain when it was relatively healthy and then they come to autopsy and we get pathology that shows all kinds of stuff in happening in the brain. And uh, the result of that is that we decide that MRI underestimates the pathology. Well, MRI was done, let's say, five years before uh, death. And at that point, uh, the brain was healthier. Um, so, yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent points from uh, uh, both uh, uh, from from uh, both Dirk um, and uh, uh, Eddie. Um, any other um, inputs related to how we get people with in vivo and ex vivo MRI? Yes, Christine. I was listening quietly here. I, I just want to, you know, as, as we're thinking, part of this, I think, is also thinking outside the box, right? Are there uh, ways that we can leverage technology and all the discussions about machine learning, I think do also um, motivate, I am not a machine learning person, but people more brilliant than I am are, uh, considerations of how to use those varying intervals, antemortem intervals, uh, for essentially reverse translation, using the pathology and going backwards. And if you get enough of them using machine learning to be able to inform what it would have looked like throughout that progression. The other point to make um, is just for the imaging of frail people, Constantinos, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, actually, that was one of the original motivations uh, for us to start doing both cadaveric and ex vivo on postmortem imaging side because the cadaveric MRI gave us the precise moment at the time of autopsy obviously limited by time but that again is where if physicists or engineers you know can uh, continue to develop uh, just as Julie said you know the 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 fields continue to move then you know that what you can get in that short period of time can be more valuable um, and the last point is really outside the box but it is to say that um, in applications, I know for myself, uh, that we've done in military combat casualty care settings, there are mobile MRI scanners. And if the NIH were so inclined, um, we could imagine taking uh, the, the, the scanner to the patient instead of expecting the patient to come to us. And I agree, I think there's an important bias that we are missing in research MRI um, as it even pertains to health equity and who comes for those research MRI scans is truly a biased sample that I think we need to understand more. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Great points. I mean, there's, there's, definitely, there's definitely a challenge in being able to procure a whole brain in, in the autopsy process. We found that surprisingly difficult for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so there needs to be better coordination, I think. There are very few groups that are doing this um, if, we're, if the goal is to get the entire brain or hemisphere. Yeah, I'll just add that there are things that you can do if you have the intact hemisphere that you kind of lose the capability to do if you don't. That, you know, once you've lost the topology of the folding patterns, you can't ever really recover it. You can't know for certain what fold you're in. And so for example, we've built tools that allow in vivo ex vivo registration point-wise with about millimeter accuracy but that depends on an accurate representation of the folding patterns. Uh, so getting intact sensors is, is, you know, is technologically important from my point of view. I, I understand it's difficult. 
All right. Uh, maybe we should move on then to the next point, which was also discussed previously, but now I would like to hear uh, the imagers' point of view. So what are the barriers in uh, uh, collaboration between imagers and pathologists? Pathologists said they don't understand the imagers. Uh, do the imagers say they don't understand the pathologists? Or <laughs> what's, the, what's the answer? No, the pathologists have been great. I love the pathologists I've worked with. I, I, don't, <laughs> I, haven't had, had that. I would not say that's been an issue. I think it's very easy to define why we need to work closely with pathologists as imagers, but I'm not sure overall pathologists are seeing a huge value in doing MRI or imaging um, that could continue in the field. So that in this last session, I really didn't hear a good argument yet for why we even need to do this. I think there is, but I'm not sure if it's that way from the pathology side. How about for uh, adding information that may not be uh... Uh, easily detectable, let's say in pathology, for example, microbleeds. Uh, typically, the microbleeds that uh, you see in uh, uh, a few uh, samples that you collect through the brain um, may be far fewer than what you may see in an image. Like, that that would be one added I, benefit, right? Yeah, I could give you two examples from stuff we're doing in a minute. I mentioned the stuff we're doing with Dirk, where we project things like resting state parcellations onto his data, so he knows. If somebody wants to look at, you know, the default mode network, he knows where those blocks are. Um, the other thing we've been doing with the neurobiobanks with people like Harry is doing these 3D scans that Partha mentioned, uh, and we can use the 3D scans to register to in vivo coordinate systems uh, and do things like predict, you know, where's the border of broadband area 44 or 45. Uh, so trying to attach, you know, the rich data that we've been able to acquire in human brain mapping over the last 25 years. Uh, to guide the pathology and to kind of attach that to blocks as they get distributed. Christine? Yeah, and Larry, I would just add, you know, and it comes from work that your group has done too with microhemorrhage, right? You know, the thing on the imaging side for me that drives me bananas, as Dirk would say, uh, is, you know, when you say, oh, CT scan, DAI. It's like, you're not looking at axons, folks, you know? And so um, I bring it up as, you know, limited on the imaging side, but to your point about how do we help the neuropathologist, image guided tissue sectioning, done. I mean, that's just, that's one suggestion. And in that, that can come out and bore out in a lot of different ways. But as we heard from brilliant, you know, work that, um, that Swati has been doing and others, just white matter hyperintensities alone, um, you know, they can't see it as well in the tissue and we can provide some guidance and they can help us understand what, as Julie said, is really under all those WMHs because it's not all the same pathology, um, but from blood to lesioning to a lot of things, I think even, even in the absence of more one-to-one -one mapping at the cellular level, our crude imaging still plays a role in almost that reverse engineering effect of informing where to look. Because remember from a neural path perspective, they're not sampling 100% of the tissue. I see Dirk's hands up, I'll let him say, you know, how much they actually look. It's a small percent of the tissue and resources are limited as is time. So if we can help in that way to inform selection of not everything, right? We'll, we'll never remove the neuropathologist. That is the gold standard. They'll always have a job. I hope to put myself out of business someday, but you know, uh, I, think, I think that's just something to, to keep in mind is, is image guided tissue sampling as a kind of theme in response. Uh, 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 real brief, Larry, that's your, your point is really good. I think you're preaching to the choir on this meeting, right? I mean, all of the neuropathologists on this call get it, I think, but it's an important point. Why, why should, why, you know, I've been doing neuropathology for 50 years. I don't need to, I don't need an, an MRI to figure it out. And I would just go back to, we do need to convince people that with an MRI, we can see lesions, we can see structures that we can't see as pathologists. So we need to convince people that there are advantages that uh, supersede what we can do as pathologists. And then the other, the other point that I think is really important, in addition to what Bruce said, I think, I think using the imaging to, to parcelate the tissue and be able to more accurately sample either for diagnosis or for research is really important. Um, but the last thing, there are, there are, there is such a wealth of quantitative data that you can get from an MRI scan, an ex vivo MRI scan that, you know, we, I work with Christine in, in, a lot on this, obviously, but just the volumetrics that you can get from an MRI scan can be really, really helpful when you're thinking about regions that may be subtly affected and you don't actually have a specific lesion or correlating back to 
different functional deficits that a person had. And so I think there's a ton of value. I think your point is, and I agree, we may need to, we may need to communicate that better. Well, and I think that, you know, just to follow up on something that Anne McKee said in the last session is there's the whole other direction. Like there's all these diagnoses that are made ex vivo, all these things we only find out under the microscope, but we have no idea what the in vivo patterns of those are. If we could project those things back to in vivo populations, you go to the ADNI data set and say, you know, is there some subpopulation here that, you know, we think correlates with this specific, you know, subtype of AD, that kind of thing. Perfect. Yeah, Rebecca? Yes, well, I'll just speak from a completely practical point of view is that, you know, why would pathologists not want to participate in this kind of thing? And um, I, just speaking again for myself and as a <laughs> city government employee who has an unbelievable workload on a daily basis, you know, these, some of you guys know, I mean, I'm signing out hundreds of brains a year myself. Um, and while I'm obviously very interested, that's why I'm here, that's why I participated in this kind of thing basically my whole career, um, the constraints on me are to render the diagnostic findings that are relevant to determining the cause and manner of death. And now, of course, I'm in a different, I'm not in a hospital setting, I'm not in a brain bank. Um, however, I'm where the traumatic cases live. This is where they come through. This is incidentally where a lot of dementia and developmental, I mean everything, you know, but there isn't, and I've been trying very hard myself to change the culture in such a way here that that uh, medical examiners and public health people realize how valuable this interaction is. Um, but it's, um, it's not set up here to, you know, foster that kind of thing. So I just want to make sure people are aware of that particular angle. And in hospital settings too, some of them are not doing very much autopsies. They don't get reimbursement for it. They don't get credit for it, uh, you know, when it comes time to promotion. Let me tell you all about that, um, you know, and, you know, maybe you'll get 10% of your salary or whatever, but your chairman is not going to jump up and down about that, you know, and, um, and if you're working on a collaborative thing that's, you know, tens of thousands of people <laughs> working on it and you're, you know, one of a million authors, Again, you know what I'm saying? These are just all realities. Yeah. For me personally, yeah. I'm past the point in my life where I care about that kind of thing, and I'm just interested in trying to help understand, you know, the correlation between radiology and pathology because I think it's absolutely key to going forward. But I'm just telling you, if you haven't thought about it, those of you who aren't in clinical practice, uh, you know, in neuropathology or familiar with the constraints that are on us, you know, you might just, it might just help you understand why there yeah. might not be so much, you know, um, enthusiasm on the part of neuropathologists in your institution. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Parsa. Yeah, I just want to second what Rebecca said from practical experience, my neuropathologist colleague at uh, Johns Hopkins, I, do, I don't want to, you know, kind of <clears throat> make uh, uh, personal uh, research cases out of this, but he, he basically can get time off from his department chair because you know there's a funding issue, he's not really gonna get credit for it. Um, so I think more funding, research funding perhaps, and opportunities for the neuropathologists would facilitate this linkage better. And that somehow is, for whatever reason, much better available to people working on the MR side, uh, whether it was due to fMRI or, you know, the research interests of physicists, that level of research interest is not, you know, funded or supported if that support exists. And I, you know, I don't have any ax to grind here. I'm not a neuropathologist, but I've noticed this. Great. All right, let's move on to a little more practical issue, um, uh, fixation, um, perfusion fixation, immersion fixation, uh, or unfixed, 
uh, and imaged in situ. What what do you prefer? Uh, what what do you think is uh, best? What works for you? Um, and the, the next question, just to prepare you for that, uh, is that at some point I'd like to discuss uh, if there is a possibility of standardization of any of these uh, protocols for handling um, brains. Um, so can we agree on one type of fixation, for example? Yeah, as Eddie mentioned before, it takes uh, something like four to six weeks to fully fix the hemisphere. You know, to get into the interior of the white matter. I know when Rebecca was in Boston, um, she taught us how to inject formalin into the ventricles. And so I think that's one way to speed it up. But, but there are probably other tricks that can be played uh, to kind of shorten that clock. But the practical thing, right, is that the MR properties vary dramatically based on the level of fixation and hydration of the tissue that we're imaging. So it's critical. If we're going to compare across uh, across centers, I was going to say something similar that it depends on what you want to image and also what path marker you would like to study and do the different fixation methods affect the quality of staining and measurements. So is the answer then that uh, we're never going to be finding one? fixation approach that works for everything or most things that we're interested in? It, it really depends on the research question also, right? Like what are you trying to get at and what, it, yeah, what is your specific study? But I think what we probably still don't fully understand some of the effects of fixation on, on different outcome markers. So maybe additional sort of validation studies that really dig into those processes, like over time, uh, longitudinal, if you like ex vivo imaging after longitudinal times of fixation, like you've done, Constantinos, it's, that's super valuable to understand how those tissue properties change over time. And I think we still have a lot to learn there. Yep. And, and some and things are very robust yeah. to fixation. Just we found that the myelinated fibers really don't care how you fix it. And that you can correlate with the diffusion tensor. Exactly. Yeah, and some things you may prefer to image before um, the brain is fixed uh, even uh, because things change so fast. Uh, diffusion, for example, uh, diffusivity drops so fast um, that you better get the information as quickly as possible after death if you have the chance to. Yes, Varam? Um, yeah, I just wanted to interject that from a brain banking perspective, uh, there are other considerations to keep in mind, which is we have an obligation not only to the imaging community, but to all of the other research communities as well. So a fixation protocol that might be optimal for imaging is not necessarily a fixation protocol that's optimal for clearing, for example or for uh, some immunohistochemical studies. And that has to be juggled and factored in. We all believe that our, our own studies are the most important and the most critical of the day, but there are lots of people with similar views. Yeah, so if you have uh, multiple studies that are ongoing, and that, that that's also uh, what uh, was going on uh, when I started doing ex vivo imaging uh, with uh, Julie Snyder at Rush, uh, there were already uh, several studies that were ongoing that had a specific uh, fixation protocol. Uh, and I did not want to make any changes there or even propose to make any changes uh, there. So in terms of fixation protocol or in terms of uh, what fluids the tissue be when you put it in the MRI scanner, I want to have as little changes as possible. Um, so uh, I would love to be using Fomblin, but I never even suggested it. <laughs> uh, and maybe it works. Um, uh, many other, many of you uh, are using it or similar uh, uh, similar things to, to Fomblin. Um, but yes, there is this complication that several of these studies are already ongoing and in order to add the ex vivo imaging you cannot change everything that has been going on for years that's another complication swati oh uh, i was going to change the topic a little bit i was going to ask if you don't want to fix the brain 
how long, as an imager, I don't know, but how long can we image the brain? Can I image for two hours or eight hours? When, at what point is the tissue being degraded and when will not be useful for any of the histopath portion? So is, do, we have, do we know that time limit? It depends on the application. So if you wanna, and we don't even, and Eddie brought this up earlier, there's so much more involved than PMI so if you wanna if you wanna image the brain for twelve hours uh, in the cadaver or fresh or whatever, and then you just wanna look at plaques and tangles histologically, that brain will be fine. You can leave that brain for a couple of days. But if you wanna do, you know, maybe uh, you know RNA seq or some of these other applications, um, or if you wanna you know generate cell lines from meninges or something like that, then the timing is a little bit different. So it depends on the application. Dimitri. Yes, thanks. So uh, I actually second the concern about uh, fixation. In MRI, uh, the more exquisite metric you look, the more fixation may affect it, uh, especially now in the era of quantitative MRI, tissue microstructure imaging. Um, uh, if you go into water fractions in different cell com cellular compartments, uh, diffusivities inside axons, outside axons, etc. Those are really nice, potentially super sensitive and specific um, biomarkers. Fixation does change a lot and in different ways. And for instance, one of the major issues is um, it affects extracellular space. Uh, it shrinks it and it's a problem and it changes morphology by a lot. If there's any, I hear manitol is something that people add, but I, I'm not an expert in it at all. But I, I, I would really suggest that that could be a point of concern and, and point of um, differences in between different um, centers, different, uh, different studies, even if the protocols are similar, or say MRI measurement protocols are similar. So that's, that's, a, that's a concern. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dan. Um, no problem. I'm just yeah. So in terms of uh, from our experience, um, yes, of course, fixation changes everything, um, but degradation also changes everything, and uh, we feel like the trade-off for whole brain, if the fixation fully takes you know four to six weeks, then you have this degradation gradient and it affects all of the MR properties. Uh, of course, the histology becomes an issue, but also from the MR perspective, everything you measure is, is then just biased and it's, it's a nonlinear relationship. We don't fully understand it. So the way we handle it is um, cortical, um, just, just you know, cutting the brain uh, cortically and, and, and then you know, um, fixing those uh, slabs. And then we, you know, you can image uh, uh, tissue blocks. So this is, again, it goes to the question of the um, the next question, I guess, clinical versus small bore scanners. And you know, if we really want to do a whole brain or a hemisphere, that's that's great. That's important for 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 a lot of a lot of different reasons. But maybe we ought to be looking at these tissue blocks, um, which with with high kind of robust uh, fixation to do this studies or pilot studies or proof of concept studies to actually understand what we have there and be able to compare, you know, across. Yeah, that's, thanks. Yeah, great. All right, um, another practical question uh, for everyone um, regarding MRI scanning. There are three issues uh, that uh, we've pointed out here. Uh, four issues really. Uh, it's the clinical versus small bore uh, issue, which is relatively trivial. I mean, if you have a big uh, sample, you put in a clinical scan. If you have a small sample, you put in a small bore, if it's available. Uh, but then there are three issues: uh, holder for the brain, uh, benefits of that. Uh, uh, are are there any vibration issues, and do we care about that? Uh, at some point, I remember we built some uh, structure up made out of wood uh, that was holding the brain in the in the coil without touching any part of the scanner. Um, that was a crazy idea and I, I don't think it helped that much. Um, and uh, the favorite subject of uh, most of us, uh, air bubbles. So let's start with uh, the holder. Um, do we need the holders? Um, is it important for the co-registration? Um, opinions about the holders, 3D holders. 
Yeah, it's important for lots of reasons. I mean, it's important for registration. You know, part that I mentioned cutting in the holders. It's important because you don't want giant amounts of extra fluid. You know, you want to want to keep the coils as close to the samples you can. Uh, you want to minimize air bubbles. The holders can help with that. There are lots of reasons why holders are important. And Bruce, uh, what uh, what is your uh, time scale, uh, and what is the number of brains that you have? So, how many holders do you uh, do you build, and how long does it take? Uh, so we don't build custom ones the way Parfa does. Uh, we okay. typically, uh, you know, one of the things that helps for us is that we we pack our samples in the holder days before we're going to scan. Uh, so we let air bubbles, kind of the air bubbles trapped in the deep soul side, come out, and we agitate the sample. So there's a whole series of, you know, this kind of black magic stuff that we do to try and get rid of air bubbles. In the end, we can't get rid of all of them. Uh, and so one of the things that we've been doing lately is trying to combine gradient echo and spin echo MR where you know, the spin echo has the distortions, but not the dropout. And so the combination of the two uh, allows us to recover signal in regions where we lost air bubbles, uh, sorry, lost signal to air bubbles. Great. Larry, I thought that you were going to say something. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, you know, this is all Alison Griffin's work. She's a graduate student now at Nashville, but we've been using these 3D printed holders per brain and they're made with slicing you know, so the, the brain is collected and then it's scanned with the CT, a holder's made, and it's been fantastic because then we are able to get very parallel cuts and we can block it out. We know exactly where we are, but it's expensive. It's not practical. I know the NIMH brain bank was doing this on a, a limited number of holders based on size, I think, and that was helpful. Great. Christine. Larry, what about the vacuum? Yeah. That's, there's the, you know, the two issues I think you'll hit on is the Fomblin. We're not sure, and there's a lot of controversy seen in the chats on whether Fomblin, Fomblin is good or bad and a form, uh, you know, a, a fluorinated oil um, for the histology. It'd be great to hear everybody. And the other is we'd pull a vacuum. So we vacuum impregnate, and that could also damage tissue. We're not sure. So we pull the vacuum before we put the Fomblin in in the holder. It does a great job at eliminating bubbles. <laughs> but if there's something trapped in there, it may actually distort the tissue. Great point. Christine? I just wanted to make the additional comment as it pertains to holders of just the consideration of sites and the number of brains per year they're doing. So one of the you know things that we tried to do with Bruce's group was try to harmonize certain sequences. But as an example, we don't do everything they do because we're more of a high throughput site with Dirk's leadership and the neuropath core. Um, we're routinely now imaging close to 175 brains for them every single year. We have over 400 brains imaged ex vivo and now over 100, both with cadaveric and ex vivo. So when you're talking about you know, expensive specific devices, I think there needs to just be that consideration of what is the, the frequency of imaging? What are the, what's the case flow gonna look like? And if you're trying to standardize something across something like NeuroBioBank, um, how does that impact resources that would be required? That's all. Exactly. Can you say can you yeah. say something about the agaros while you're on? Oh yeah. <laughs> Larry knows this, yeah. Um, so, you know, and actually very similar to Constantinos, uh, when Dirk and I started working together, um, you know, when I was at, in Wash U days playing around with stuff in the, meta, in the ME's office, yeah, you know, Fomblin was a thing, but just like Constantinos, I came out here and the neuropath core had an approach to how they did brains and I wasn't gonna impact their approach because we're trying to do this in the most efficient way. And so they embed their brains in agaros, um, but it works great. And it's the same stuff we're doing that you guys all do. We try to pull out the bubbles, we get all of this stuff out as much as we can. It's not perfect. Um, it does help with stability, but we still pack it in the coil, same as you know everybody's talking about. Um, and essentially it just required an uh, MR compatible scaffolding because the rods that they used to use were metal because they didn't have to worry about metal until we showed up and said, hey, we want to throw this in a magnet. Uh, so it's it's a, a plastic uh, with a, the agar uh, tied down. And then it's the same thing. It's kind of similar to what you're describing, Larry, with your mold, which is they have them uh, to, uh, tied down and secured to a scaffold so that they're getting those precise four millimeter coronal slices on the fixed tissue on the fixed hemisphere. And then for the rapids for when they're sliding fresh tissue, it goes into dental alginate. They also have a jig to get precise four millimeter slices of the fresh tissue. So that for example, the photographs that Bruce was referencing can be utilized for surface registration purposes. But yeah, that difference of high throughput versus like what I would call, you know, Bruce's group high dimensional is just something we should probably keep in mind. Great. 
All right, moving on to what I uh, warned you about er earlier. Uh, can we standardize? Is it possible to standardize imaging protocols and uh, uh, tissue handling protocols? Uh, Dan, for example, previously uh, said that uh, if the tissue is small, then maybe we can do this. Uh, if the tissue is large, hemisphere, whole brain, then maybe we can do that. So. Is it that if you we have like three different uh, imaging protocols or three different uh, tissue handling protocols that if the uh, if we're talking about small chunks of tissue, then this is the approach or this is the suggested approach, right? Because we all know what happens if you require people to do stuff. Uh, this is the suggested approach and tested, let's say. And uh, if you have a whole hemisphere, if you have a whole brain, this is the recommended. Uh, th this is the best practices document, let's say, that describes. Uh, the above. Should we be making a best practices document for small chunks of tissue and uh, whole brains, uh, or is it not possible? I think maybe like a lot of us have experienced who first started doing ex vivo MRIs, like you got to go through a ton of troubleshooting, right? Like setting it up, figuring out the best way for your own research questions. And, and I think when I started, if there would have been something like a best practices document to refer to and sort of, okay, these are the things you need to keep in mind setting setting it up in the first place, I think would have been incredibly helpful. I think there's an incredible sort of body of knowledge here among all of us that we can pull something together and to help researchers who come into the fields to refer to that document. So here are a couple of things to, to consider. Uh, and then also how to report your parameters in, in a research paper, like this is what you did and, and, and why and, and why you should report this or that. I think that could be incredibly helpful. But it's it's tricky because every yeah, every research question is different. So you want to have different exactly. applications. But something as a starting point when you're new to the field and start doing this as, as a first time, I think would be super helpful. Yeah, and I'm sure that we're not going to capture everything, uh, but uh, at least uh, if it helps uh, people that are getting into the field to to try something if they, if they don't have a preference at the start, let's say, and it's uh, they're starting fresh, let's say, uh, then maybe they can follow these uh, instructions in the in the best practices document. Um, so it wouldn't be something for uh, you, Suzanne, let's say, to change in your um, daily practice. Let's say it will be something that will be useful to people that are joining the field. I think you could also we, we actually, best practices. You sorry, could how how to get started at do's and don'ts these are things that haven't worked in the past for so and so reason I think for for new investigators that was equally helpful yeah yeah i was just gonna say that over the last year year and a half we've put together exactly that you know we have an extensive series of documentation uh, instead of documentation on you know what works what doesn't work you know what do you like I step how you go through the scan, you know, you acquire the field maps, you list the field across this, you do that. Um, it's a little bit specific to our um, very cantankerous, extremely old seven Tesla scanner. So some of it wouldn't translate, but you know, a lot of it does. It you know, includes things like packing procedures. And you know, we happy to give that to anyone who's interested. That'd be great. Yeah, I think that uh, we can generalize where necessary or keep things where uh, we can keep things. Um, okay, so it seems like there may be a possibility for putting together such a document uh, to cover several cases, uh, several scenarios, maybe not all scenarios, but at least several scenarios. All right, uh, sounds good. Let's see how we're doing in terms of time. Um, so uh, let's move on to the issue of uh, atlases. In vivo, we have good atlases or atlases that work uh, for now at least. Um, ex vivo, we don't have such a thing. And uh, when we move ex vivo, we have a little more freedom in terms of uh, what goes into the atlas because in vivo we have, uh, we're limited by the in vivo MRI uh, resolution uh, in most cases. But ex vivo, we can have atlases that have multiple uh, resolutions. Um, that can include the MRI information, but they can also include uh, the um, uh, pathology information, histology in general. Um, thoughts, thoughts about that? Do we need these atlases? Uh, should the NIH invest in making, uh, in building these atlases, or do you feel the in vivo atlases we have already are sufficient? Yes, Peter. 
Well, so for normal subjects, you know, atlases make a lot of sense and, you know, conditions like TBI or stroke or, you know, where you can have issues in different parts of the brain, there's no clear way to standardize. So, you know, I think you have to think about looking at uh, what you see versus what's possibly normal. Um, and I think that's the best you can do right now, I think. Others. So, would we need a normal atlas, for example? No. And then is the question normal older adult, normal young adult, normal Partha? Yeah, I just wanted to again uh, shamelessly promote our work, but uh, uh, we are building an atlas, you know, and, and would love for to reach out to people who are interested. It's a mammoth piece of work, right? We are basically going to get uh, hopefully two hemispheres and two full adult brains, um, <clears throat> serial section 20 microns, HNE, Nissel, and myelin uh, with the uh, uh, MRI before. And so uh, we cannot do all of this ourselves. Uh, we, are, we are gonna try. So if anybody's really interested in that, we'd love to chat as well. I, I think, I think you, there's a good point to be made there, which is, I mean, these things that we're talking about are incredibly granular and they're important, but they're granular. And what it seems to me we're failing to articulate is a bigger vision for this sort of consortium or collaboration across, you know, multiple groups, you know, so hopefully something comes out of this as a better statement of why this is an important thing to do. And that'll help drive the funding. It's not going to be these details that we're talking about. Yeah. And I do think that the uh, atlases, uh, multiple types of atlases are necessary. I don't think that there is one atlas that does everything. Um, and I think that especially when we're using ex vivo imaging um, and pathology and histology in general, uh, I think that just MRI information can be at multiple resolutions at multiple levels. Um, it can focus on uh, different uh, groups of people. Uh, there is many different ways to uh, build these atlases to be useful for disease X or disease Y and so on. Um, so yeah. I think that sure. my, my, my personal opinion is that we found uh, in vivo atlases uh, useful in neuroimaging. And I believe that ex vivo atlases are uh, pretty much ex vivo MRI uh, atlases plus histology are really important to have. Yeah, I would distinguish between having multiple kinds of information in an atlas and multiple atlases. I, I'm not in general a fan of atlas proliferation. I know like in the imaging community, there's been this argument, do we want an atlas for 40 year olds and 80 year olds and 60 year olds? And the problem is that you introduce discontinuities into your analysis that are very difficult to get around. And so our approach has always been to make the atlases uh, smarter and more sophisticated. So we, we build what we call conditional atlases. This is work that Adrian Dalka at MGH has been doing. Uh, so where things like age are um, an input to an atlas to you know, you, where you, you produce an atlas uh, given the demographic information. So you, you kind of combine everything that you know about the brain into a single atlas coordinate system. But then if you have a specific question, like you know maybe Susanna's interested in the vasculature or something, then we can build estimates of vascular boundaries or anatomical boundaries or functional boundaries or whatever. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my general philosophy. Yeah, so one thing I wanted to, uh, uh, to, to point out, to clarify uh, maybe on my point is that uh, ex vivo, for example, from, from our own work, let's say we have ex vivo images and we're doing uh, voxel-wise analysis on these uh, images. Uh, we have to make our own templates in order to register our hemispheres uh, because we don't have a whole brain uh, ex vivo image, we just have a hemisphere. Uh, so we need many of those in order to make a hemisphere template. Uh, since many of us are imaging whole hemispheres, maybe having a hemisphere template would be uh, a good thing to have. Um, or uh, people are imaging only the hippocampus at very high detail having um, population-based uh, template of ex vivo image hippocampus uh, may be a good thing to have for voxel-wise analysis and so on. Um, thoughts? Um, I, I just wanna say, 
I think it's um it's important for us to not I mean I mean it's important for us to also keep in mind that a lot of these things that we're seeing in ex vivo needs to be you know seen in vivo and so we have to find I mean it goes to one of those questions that we were supposed to talk about is how we actually do translate our finding in in vivo and so if we focus all of our efforts on atlasing and um you know, coming up with real amazing atlases ex vivo, it still doesn't prove that we could see these things in vivo. And, you know, I think in terms of funding and funding question, usually, um, you know, people are interested in, in helping live people, live, live participants or subjects. So it's always the question, can you do it in vivo? And so we, as, as a group, to want to promote this, I think we need to think uh, in, that, in that way in my, my opinion. So then, then this is an important point, and maybe this is a good time to talk about this translation. We're skipping ahead, but that's uh, fine. I don't know if we'll have time to talk about everything. Um, so in terms of uh, translation, uh, to go from ex vivo to in vivo, uh, we've been using information from people that have both types of images. Um, we have many ex vivo images, and we have many in vivo images, but only a smaller group of people have both in vivo and ex vivo. and then. Those that have in vivo images, the question is when were they acquired? The anti-mortem interval that we were talking about earlier, is it three years or is it three months? Um, so we're trying to focus the translation uh, to those people that have very short uh, anti-mortem uh, intervals. Um, so so my uh, one, one question that I wanted to ask is, uh, um, the issue of resolution, let's say. Uh, do you feel that um, really high resolution ex vivo imaging uh, is uh, uh, absolutely necessary, let's say, thinking about translation and applying this in vivo? Or uh, you think that uh, it's good to see ex vivo, but then it cannot be translated to in vivo and it's not uh, uh, as useful. Again, these are. I'm not expressing opinions here. I'm just trying to um, uh, start uh, the discussion. Yeah, it completely depends on what you're interested in. Like we do ridiculously high resolution ex vivo because we're interested in kind of mesoscopic architecture. We want to know what's going on with cortical layers and cortical columns and uh, you know architectonic boundaries. But if you just wanted to take your narrow path and go back to, uh, you know, uh, an in vivo atlas, Thomas Yeo's atlas, or the, the you know, the Glasser Van Essen atlas, whatever, then that stuff is irrelevant. You know, you just need a one millimeter scan to get the 3D geometry of the brain in order to do inference. So it really depends, I think, on your question. Yep. Eddie. Um, just to follow up on, because uh, because uh, people here at Penn are interested in, you know, cortical lamination and stuff, and you get some of that with with high resolution MR. Um, um, and it is relevant because, you know, certain types of dementias affect deeper cortical layers versus superficial. Um, and so another attack could be, um, there's no absolute reason why the, the in vivo MRI has to be a whole brain either, right? You could get higher resolution of just like a, like a pseudo biopsy, uh, and, and start to approach higher resolution that, that it's not going to get all the way. I, I don't, I don't think, but. That, that's some of the conversations we're having. I, I think the translation, the translation from something that's seen in vivo on MRI to something that's seen in pathology is, is easier to solve. But, but things that are seen in pathology where we may not have an imaging marker, that's much more difficult. Absolutely, yep. Um, and, and to the point, I, I think also that, you know, if you, as an MR, from the MR side, if you are into developing diagnostic tools, then it's important to keep in mind when you do ex vivo work to use to to not go to super high resolution because whatever you see there i mean you won't be able to see in a clinical scanner but if you're interested in looking at you know some 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 fine architecture then of course um that makes sense but for a diagnostic tools then we need to keep it um, as similar as much as we can um yeah, and also, um, you know, uh, animal models is is one way to go. I'm not I'm not a fan, and I've, I, we haven't been using those. But in vivo animal model, ex vivo, 
histology uh, and then you can keep this uh going and and maybe not to uh, a good it's not may not be a good um, disease model but it can be a good neuropathology model for for amyloid plaques for example you know if you're looking only at the chemistry and microstructure and not concerned about the disease per se but the pathology then it may actually be a pretty good um study design you know that kind of thing dimitri yeah dimitri yeah so actually it's good that Dan mentioned modeling, and I think that's really a non-trivial bridge between ex vivo and in vivo, because if you go to the biophysical origins of, say, MRI signal, uh, at, say, diffusion MR, it's basically at the cellular level, uh, you're, after death, this major restrictions, cell walls, they don't go away, and the parameters change, diffusivities change, as I mentioned, the extracellular volume fraction relatively changes, and so on, but the functional form of many of these models uh, in principle should not. And you can think of having ex vivo detailed, very well done scans and validated against uh, some kind of histology is a way to validate such models and then translate them, apply them in vivo. And of course you will have different diffusivities, but still like if there is axonal beading, you would see interaxonal diffusivity along the axons dropping because of the beating, because of say tra traumatic brain injury. And the values will be different ex vivo, but the relative change will be not notable as well. And that is kind of what I think research is all about, is not having just tons of data and drowning in it, but understanding what's relevant and what's not and translating all of this multiple measurements into things that we can actually grasp, understand, and relate to each other from the biophysical standpoint. So I think as a modeler, my group is done mostly in vivo work, but I'm extremely interested in this kind of synergies between in vivo and ex vivo from the model validation and development standpoint. So that's very helpful. I think uh, by correspondence, it doesn't really mean identical. It makes the question harder, but what you have in vivo, what can you do? What can you image in vivo and what can you image ex vivo and still be able to relate them fairly well? That's the correspondence you're looking for. It's not the same resolution or the exact same protocol. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the same values. Uh, they can be related uh, linearly, let's say, as long as you know that relationship, as long as the relationship exists, uh, that's all you need. You know, one practical example that's very robust is the principal orientation of the diffusion tensor. So whatever you do, ex vivo, histology, you're probably not gonna mess it up. And so this yeah, but that's too like, trivial part. Of that. No, 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 no. But even that doesn't exist. You know, I mean, look, well, we, we, I'm trying to say there's one existence proof, then, you know, there'll be the next one. So, you know, all hope is not lost here, I think. Uh, to, to your point, though, having some theoretical understanding is yeah. going to be necessary. We cannot just rely on machine learning because this yes. came up earlier. Yes. If you take the data driven approach, you're going to be very sensitive to the training data. So that's a great approach, but it has to be supplemented with understanding. I think that's what Dimitri is saying. Yes, yes. Thanks, Pratha, for underscoring that. And I agree with your comment in the chat. There is a difference between data interpolation and true understanding. Great. Uh, and Sini is uh, telling me that uh, we need to start wrapping up. I have a, there, there's a few more questions that we had uh, decided to discuss. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, an important question in my mind since we're talking about combining ex vivo MRI and pathology and then translating it to in vivo to try to predict the presence or detect the presence of detect pathologies uh, in vivo. Uh, so have we done that? Uh, and uh, do we have imaging markers of uh, pathology that are already available? Um, in our collaboration, uh, in my collaboration with Julie, we've uh, uh, put together the ARTS biomarker that predicts the presence of arteriolosclerosis using uh, uh, machine learning and combining ex vivo MRI and pathology and then translating to in vivo. Do we have other markers uh, that um, um, are coming out or are already out? And what kinds of pathologies do you think that we will be able to detect through this process? using MRI, not fully detect, fully uh, uh, mole molecularly specific, let's say, uh, level, uh, but to predict with a pretty good 
performance. Maybe there's a slightly, I mean, for me, there's a slightly different way to frame that. I mean, there's, there's sure. definitely a need for um, surrogate clinical endpoints, surrogate biomarkers, and MRI hasn't done terribly well. It's failed again and again to find some surrogate marker for clinical outcome. So there's some faith that if you could get closer to pathology, then we could find, you know, for instance, in a drug trial or pharmaceutical trial, we could get closer to the action of the drug. So I'm hoping that maybe something goes in that other direction as really an FDA kind of biomarker that could be validated and then used in vivo, non-invasively in MRI. That's a, sort of a, a hope. Um, and I don't think we have any yet. Um, or many, <laughs> mm -hmm. if we're going to treat, you know, AD, for instance, or no thoughts out there. So, do you, so do you feel uh, uh, do you feel MRI has lost the battle uh, uh, in predicting uh, AD pathology uh, to PET? Losing. Maybe in terms of performance, it's not as uh, uh, as good. But if it approaches the performance of PET um, and approaches relatively loosely defined, uh, MRI would have a, a number of advantages over PET. I, I'm just my opinion. Part of the issue is already addressed by in the first session is that it, a lot of the imaging findings are non-specific. Single imaging findings tend to be very non-specific. Could be sensitive, but fairly non-specific. Other thoughts? Um, isn't it the case for the amyloid immunotherapy trials that that cortical thinning gets worse? I don't know if I should say worse. You have more cortical thinning, but the amyloid is clearing. And so there's this interesting, we don't know what it does clinically yet for the, so, but there's this interesting dichotomy now between PET and MR where they're saying different things now and that kind of proves it. And it's it's because in my mind, MRI, the, the cortical thinning is an indirect measure, obviously, right? Whereas amyloid PET is actually looking at the, the molecular changes that are occurring. Um, and the prediction is that PET will be beat by plasma <laughs> biomarkers soon, so. All right, uh, any last thoughts? Um, Carlos is saying we can go until 4.50, okay. If that's right, Carlos, then I can ask a, a couple more questions. Um, so um, again, thinking out, outside of uh, the box, what I would like to get from pathology would be uh, whole brain uh, information where I know where everything is, right? And I know that I'm not gonna get this, but uh, is there something in between that we can possibly get uh, that is relatively fast? Uh, and what would we need in order to, to get there so that we can combine uh, our ex vivo uh, images or our in vivo images with that more detailed pathology? Or is it necessary? Do you think is it, it's necessary or not? I'm wondering if Harry would comment on, he was going to post a very big neuropath database online of uh, HNE images, and he and I had spoken about connecting that with the h &E Atlas I was making. I, I don't know, Harry, is that, uh, I, mean, I don't want to put him on the spot or he's gonna kill me. But... Yeah, thanks for putting me on the spot, Patrick. <laughs> uh, I don't know, my, uh, my immediate knee jerk to Constantino's uh, question just now was that, was to fall back on, uh, something that John Crary was saying uh, in the earlier session, and that is hopefully the combination of digital pathology with the MR uh, is gonna bring us to a point where we can answer that question in the sense that at the moment, I don't, I don't, I certainly don't have an answer to that question, but I think we are at a stage of technology and development where in the next five years, we could be 
at a place where we could answer that question. And I see Dirk just became visible again. Um, yeah, Dirk. Would love to put him in the same spot. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Harry. Um, to two points, I, I guess I'll do the second one first. I agree, going back to John, and his idea that you know artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning approaches to a small sample uh, with highly quantitative data will hopefully identify patterns that we can't that we can't that we can't see otherwise. That will help get us to the point where you know a small histology sample or, or targeted histology sampling will will um, will uh, will glean more information and so that to the last point you know i don't think we should give up on mri i feel like we, there's a lot there's a lot to be had there's there's a lot that we can do with mri as far as neuropathology but a, a, the same a, the same principle applies from what john was saying in that i think there's a lot of information there it's just maybe we haven't unlocked it yet and then and then to to the last question i mean constantinos that's the holy grail right we either need the imagers to be able to see the whole brain at microscopic level, or we need the pathologists to bring their microscopic images all the way up to the whole brain. And what it's like a race. One of us is going to get there, and then the other one's not going to be needed. And it's probably going to be the imagers because we can't just take brains out of people. So, so it's a fun it's a fun concept. But that's 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 where we're all going is to be able to just see the whole brain at, at once at microscopic scale. Well, I don't, I don't think that AI at the deep learning level is necessarily um, the answer to that last question. What I was thinking was when you combine Bruce's uh, approach and digital pathology and MR, you can get to a point where you say, take Alzheimer's as, as an example, I see this region that's full of plaques at this precise location. Combine that with mapping that precise location onto an image, uh, an MR image, and then ask, what is the, what is special about the MR image in that particular location versus an analogous location that's not full of plaques in the same brain from the same donor? Will that give us a better understanding of how brain organization is altered? by this particular lesion. And that can be applied to all kinds of situations, not necessarily Alzheimer's, but also TBI and, and, and ALS and, and, and the whole gambit. So, I think it's a great point. And, and I don't think one needs many full 3D histology brains, which we are going to get, you know, it's not, it's not far off. So I think Varam is absolutely right that you just need a few brains compared the same brain to itself, you know, the lesion spot to the rest. There's lots of cortex. Um, it, um, you know, MR is not, MR's not specific, but it is uh, awfully flexible. Uh, and so if we knew where to look in the brain, it may be that we have enough measures that we can get the specificity. You know, if, if the path could tell us this is the spot we should be looking. There, Constantius, there does seem to be a technical hurdle on the past side that we've got to get past. From images are very comfortable with 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 sort of the homogenization that happens in MR, right? We we treat a millimeter square of tissue with one number and sort of characterize that, which is more than we typically get in pathology for the entire human, right? So we need some method to go from what's done in the digital pathology to average something that we can compare to the imaging. And it's, it's solvable, but there's not a lot of people really solving that. Like how, what are the, how do we quantify what, what's being seen there um, yeah. so we can make strides? So to, to move forward in that direction, we would need uh, more digital pathology, right? Uh, and uh, the more matching of the pathology to the images and so on. 
and the shockingly big data sets. Exactly. Which we're going to hear about the technical issues uh, in uh, the following in the session tomorrow. Yeah, Rebecca. Well, what kind of scale, Larry, are you talking about? Because, I mean, we consider it <laughs> to have been a great step forward in neuropathology to be cutting sections at four and five microns thick, whereas our, you know, predecessors of the last century were, you know, cutting very, very thick sections in plastic embedding. And they, so they were seeing things you know, in um, sort of a more, I, I don't want to say macroscopic, but more, you know, um, more cells per thickness. And, you know, maybe it's, that's more of a pattern that corresponds to the averaging of, um, you know, the, the um, signals in the neuroimaging. So I don't know. I mean, no, I think it, they, it just, does those sections? <laughs> no, I think I think it can do them anymore. No one plastic embeds anything. <laughs> you know, vodka, myelin stains, and you know. I think it from the pathology side, there needs to be some way to come up with meaningful, homogenized measures of some sort. What it's not. I'm not think cell counting. It's not going to be the the intensity of the stain. There's there's got to be some way or the number of cells that are positive. What are those effective properties that are going to be used to relate? Like um, uh, Dan and Peter have a nice preprint paper looking at a GFAP related to the MR properties or the you know there's others on the myelin density um, in T1. So we need some measure like a density or I don't know any other ideas. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah no, I, I understand, but it's I, I it's hard for me to picture from the neuropath point of view, you know, what the equivalent is because we're trained to detect things, you know, at the cellular level. You know, I mean, this that's a problem for us to figure out, obviously, if that's the way it's going to need to go. But the relative fractions of different cell populations or pathological kind of cell populations or uh, tissue compartments, because th these are the building blocks of, uh, say, MR signal. And this can be indeed one to one compared to MR. Because uh, in MR, basically, the signal is homogenized over about 10 microns, because that's the, the length that typical water molecule diffuses during the MRI echo time, whether you like it or not. It, moves and so that's the homogenization that Larry is bringing up and then we ensemble average this big many over many chunks within the micro or millimeter sized box that there is a double average happening homogenization within the diffusion length of roughly 10 microns and then ensemble average over this disjoint parts of a very large millimeter sized box so that's the averaging that that's happening and that whatever we see in MR that is still survives this average and brings us the contrast that we can see uh, in diagnostic, uh, has diagnostic value. And th that connection, establishing that connection between what survives this double averaging in MR uh, from the pathology mic through microscopic information is the scientific connection that I think will really make us quantitative reproducible, able to predict things, cross-validate each other, etc. Great. All right. This has been a great session. I've been very happy to discuss with, uh, with all of you. These are all uh, issues that uh, we've been thinking since 2006, personally, with, uh, with Julie, and we're trying to solve several of these problems uh, successfully or unsuccessfully in some cases. And uh, it, it's, it's great to be working with uh, this this group here to uh, address some of these issues and hopefully we will uh, work together even more. Carlos was asking a question earlier, if there are any barriers in the, uh, the imagers working together on these, uh, on, on these issues. Um, I think uh, we don't have such barriers, uh, Carlos, um, but it's good to know uh, others that are working uh, in this uh, field we know each other through publications, et cetera. 
Uh, but it's good to have workshops like this one and discuss the issues uh, up front and exchange crazy ideas and so on. Um, so this has been uh, great in my opinion. So I'll send it back to you and Sini. Thanks, Konstantinos. And thank you so much to all of our wonderful panelists that have participated in this lively session. Um, so I'm actually going to hand it back to Carlos at this point for closing remarks. Carlos? Thanks, Nancy. So yes, thank you to the imaging group for that discussion. That was very insightful. I, I was trying to prepare some sort of summary of this session, um, but it seems like Dimitri and Larry really hit the nail on the head there with their last few comments in terms of what the true issues are between bridging the neuropathology work and the MRI work. And right, I guess a lot of that is due to the fact that right, MR by its nature is an indirect measure. And so you will get the homogenization, et cetera, which makes it very difficult um, to, to really identify what you're looking at and to have very good specific biomarkers of disease progression. Um, but hopefully, again, and I think as Dimitri mentioned, right, the and tomorrow's discussion that they, the data anal, anal, analysis folks will maybe shed some light on some potential solutions. Um, Parth has in that group and uh, has participated throughout these last couple of sessions. So looking forward to hearing from him as well as the other folks um, who will be participating. Um, and I guess just one quick thing to point out as well is just hopefully you all notice the difference in, in the type of discussions that, that we saw between the neuropathologist and the imaging group, um, right? The neuropathologist sort of, as was mentioned, maybe don't need the imagers per se <laughs> to, do, to do the work. Um, they have very direct measures and MR is very much still in some ways struggling with some technological issues um, in terms of, again, data analysis and identification. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that, that's my, those are my closing remarks for uh, today's workshop and definitely look forward to tomorrow's discussion. I don't know if any of uh, anybody else from NIH or NINDS or any of the participants uh, have anything else to add. Um, so if you do, please chime in. The comments in the chat are fantastic. If anybody hasn't looked at the chat, it's they're just fantastic. And and this will be saved um, and, and 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 online. So if anybody wants to go back and look through the chat, that'll that'll be available in the in the video recordings. All right. Well, I guess we're done for today. Thank you all and look forward to, to seeing you tomorrow.